and my my the state of my day depended on my ability to get about three bottles into me for breakfast and if I couldn't do that, and often I couldn't because I, I'd vomit and stuff, I just literally couldn't consume it anymore. I would spend the day rattling. So how much time have I spent in Thailand? Um, well, the first time I was there, Paul, I would uh, I got what we call an indulgence flight in the Marines. It's basically a, a, a ridiculously cheap flight. You can get through the military so the military can serve their bases around the world. So I flew to Hong Kong for 40 quid, right? Very interesting time in hong kong in fact the first when was this uh this was about 92. Oh, okay. um so i came out of a, a pub on new year's eve uh, in a place called lang kwai fong and there was 21 people dead lying dead in the street right you you know asia it when it goes it it mm. you can't explain it to an english person you know or, or a brit it's like nothing we experience it. Stuff goes off big time, right? Cup, cup. So basically the people had rushed outside of the pubs to count the new year in, which was like a tradition there in Lan Kwai Fong. And as the countdown went, you know, 10, nine, um, a, a mass crush developed and panic set in. And like I said, I think it was 21 people were killed. Horrendous. Couple of days later, it might even have been a couple of days before I'm walking down the street somewhere because if you've been in Hong Kong it's like a, a mad metropolis you don't even know if you're on the island or on the mainland it's, uh, because you use the the underground if you're if you're new to the place is what I'm saying and um there was a, a gangster there uh, called Yip Kai Fun who was originally born in a small fishing village in China and he kept going on the rampage in Hong Kong with AK-47s and robbing all the, the very mega plush jewelry stores. Um, and in this particular one, I think a woman was shot dead in the crossfire with the police. Um, so that was like my second experience there. But putting that to one side, Hong Kong's a, a difficult place to get under the skin mm. if you're a tourist. And I never used to travel with a, like a, a Lonely Planet or a guidebook. And the reason was, and this sounds stupid, but this is how naive I am. I didn't even know they existed. <laughs> so you're probably better off without them. I remember yeah. they're very limited. So I rocked up there. I remember spending some, you know, just going around the place. And anyway, getting to Thailand. I rushed to the airport to fly to the Philippines, right? I thought, right, I've had five days in Hong Kong. It's been great, but let's keep this travel thing going. Let's, let's go to the airport. I'll have, um, you know, five days in the Philippines. And I rocked up at, um, was it Kai Tak Airport back then? And I missed the flight, right, which is typical of me. Um, so I said, well, where else can I go? They said, oh, we've got a flight leaving for Bangkok in 20 minutes out with a credit card or whatever it was back in those yeah. days, get me on that flight, right? It was an Air India flight. And immediately I realized something was different in this part of the world because I went in the toilet on the aeroplane and there were foot marks on the seat. <laughs> so obviously someone who'd come from the back country used yeah. to, to doing the business in a hole in the ground didn't understand. No, you sit on this one. Then the one yeah. with bookmarks on the. Um, so, got in Thailand, hopped into a taxi at, at I guessing it's the old Bangkok airport. Um, I'm going, yeah. The guy said, "Which hotel, sir?" I said, "I don't want a hotel. Take me to to the bars." He's like, "No, sir. I have to take you to a hotel." And I'm like, "No, 
only had a little backbone. So take me to the bar. And this is probably familiar with your story, Paul. You know, I just oh, absolutely, yeah. Go and get drunk. And, and down to a lot of details. I, I, my first time going to Thailand. Did you remember LastMinute.com? Yes, very much. Now, I used to work. I worked as a nurse, and I used to we used to do a week of nights. And what I would do on my my last night, I would try to find somewhere to go to that like really really cheap. And just one time, I happened to be to be Bangkok. But yeah, back in those days, yes, I was a very much an alcohol enthusiast. So it was the bars. <laughs> I got my nose broken in Pat Pong, I think on the, um, was, do you remember a club there? It was, I think it was called the Pink Panther. I, 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 I tended to go to the islands pretty quick. I never really, you know, later on I did, you know, but, but during those times I was kind of just there to the islands. They tried to pull that tourist scam on us where the bouncer come, well, the, the, they pull out a bar bill and it's like 120 quid and you've had four beers, right? Oh, right, yeah. And then they try to tell you you're paying for this sex show or whatever. And I, I, I wasn't really into all that. You know, I'm not judging here, but it, it, yeah. I, I want my thing. I don't need to go abroad to kiss a girl. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Or look, or look at a girl, as the case may be. Um, and so I said to my corner, let's get out of here. And then they came up with this trumped up bar bill this is Thailand crying out. Our beer was like 12p and this is bills 120 quid. So I went to the door and the bouncer, this like, I don't know what the equivalent of a Thai triad is, but this spivvy guy just stepped out like that. So I was traveling with a South African. I went, Rob, hold my camera. He went, why Chris? I said, cause I'm going to fight this guy. When I win, we go outside for free. Right? Well, these guys, as you well know, they've been kickboxing since they're two years old. They're not stupid, and they certainly don't want to lose face to no. a to a drunken Westerner. So as I stepped up, the guy just went bang and broke my nose, and then then I got him on the floor and I was trying to hammer him. And then then they split us up. And I'm sorry, sorry, friends, I'm on talking Chris Rule story again, but it's all relevant. But it, did, um, it didn't really ruin your holiday, did it? No, but temporarily, when you've got a, a two-inch split down your nose and you're on a night out in, in Bangkok, it, mm. it, it, it made me gather my thoughts a bit, right? <laughs> I'd imagine to say the least. As if, as if it didn't get weirder, the triad guy gets up then and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he, of course, he's realising then he's making me lose face by, you know, secondly... You don't attack Westerners. It's not good for tourism, right? Mm. And so he went and got me a clump of tissues. So the guy that's just broken my nose is like holding these tissues on my nose. And I'm like, fuck off, mate. <laughs> then as we went, um, we went outside, jumped in a tuk-tuk to the hospital. And when I got to the hospital, they they stitched my nose up. I'm, I'm saying, are you supposed to give me anaesthetic when I'm drunk? And they're like, ha ha, yeah. You know, you know what it's like. No, no holds barred in Thailand. And um, I came out and I went to sign for my or buy my antibiotics or my penicillin, whatever it was. And there was a guy stood there and it's the same story the world over. He said, I'm awfully sorry. I own the club. I'm a private business manager. I'm not gangster, but the mafia run it. And I have no choice in that. Right. But this is not what we do in Thailand. I'm so sorry. Um, what can I do for you? So I said, oh, you can give us a hundred quid, right? Which is, I don't know how many thousand baht that was, but it was ridiculous. He went, no, 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 this, this Thailand, not rich here, very poor, <laughs> but bless him. He, he gave me about 25 quid and he said, right, I'm going to give you a night out now on me. Cause I own all these clubs in, you know, in, um, was it Pat Pong? So, um, took us in his first club went like that to these two girls and they came over and I'll be honest I think he picked the roughest looking girls in the club like so he didn't lose any business and they just chaperoned us around Bangkok for the night the first place they took us which you'll never forget was a boy bar right they looked at each other and smiled and went come and I can't ever put this into words either legally or illegally or whatever that that people would ever understand but back then 
there was no law in Thailand like this, right? Now it's a tourist paradise, right? Back mm -hmm. then, it was one night in Bangkok makes the hard men tumble. All of the young men, and some of them were very young, manning this bar were naked, right? Let's just say all of them were was kind of uh, doing stuff to themselves. Um, and it was just the biggest eye opener pool that, I mean, it was just hilarious. I don't know why they thought we wanted a boy bar, but, but it, you know, it was interesting. And then um, just a funny little story I'll finish off with. This guy, Rob, I met the South African. I met him in the Hard Rock Cafe. We were arm wrestling the bar staff, right? right? And we decided to travel together. And, and um, at the end of the night with these girls, we were sat in a restaurant eating some noodles. And um, I looked on the table and went, So I took some noodles out with my chopstick and I, I fed them to this invisible dog, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, of course, these girls just thought it was freaking hilarious. <laughs> right? And the, the next day, this guy, Rob, we're, we woke up in a backpacker or the dormitory or whatever it is, where the, the room that we'd got. And, and he's just chuckling. He, and I'm like, what, what is it? He went, <laughs> and I'm like, come on, what, what, what? He went, that dog, man, that was so funny. <laughs> Out of the whole night, right? We yes. nearly got our heads kicked in. It was the dog that he was. <laughs> anyway, so that was my sec. That was my first time in Thailand. I think the second time um, I was traveling through, I'd done a world trip and I was coming up from, I think I was in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. And I hopped into Thailand because my brother was teaching English there at the time. Oh. Uh, one time I drove to India. So this would have been the second time in Thailand. And by the time I, I drove a bus to India, Paul. Wow. By the, we were doing volunteer work. So we were supposed to be journalists writing articles on people living in poverty. Did you poverty. have to go through Iran or something to, to get there? Or? Yeah, we went from Norway through Europe uh, into Greece into uh, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, wow. and then finally Delhi. It's By the time funny. I got to Delhi, we all had dysentery, right? The bus had broken down every single day, almost, right? And only it was me and the other driver, Lee, who could fix it. So we were just black from head to toe all the time, covered in the mosquito bites, lost about three stone in weight. And when I got to... Um, Delhi I'll be honest we only had three weeks to travel and I thought Do you know what I'm gonna go and see my brother in Thailand so that's what I did I hopped on a plane flew to Thailand um don't regret it you know it's family's yeah. family right and it was just wonderful and like I say the third time was after this world trip and then I came back into Thailand from uh, Laos it was which was um yeah absolutely love the place how about how about you yeah i mean i i sort of fell in love with it when i came here and i i, I still love it it's an, it's an incredible place um i because i i've seen kind of both worlds of it because when i when i i came here originally i was I actually came here to stop drinking but it took me a few years to be able to do that so i was kind of a, you know i spent a lot of the time in the bars but for the last um nearly what's it 14 years it's been as a non-drinker and it's you know it's even better <laughs> it, you know it's not I, I i associated when i first came to thailand with this kind of real drinker's paradise mm. i remember going to patty and i wasn't interested in the in the girl stuff either you know i, I was just in alcohol and i remember going to patty for the first time and just seeing like there's thousands of bars that seem to be open all the time and to me like th this is heaven <laughs> Yeah, be at Chang for 25p a bottle or whatever yes. it was. And uh, so, I mean, the idea of actually kind of uh, this being a place where I'd finally quit alcohol, there was times I was dubious, but it, it, it turned out, because actually before I came to Thailand, I moved to Saudi Arabia with the intention of stopping drinking. 
I, I trained as a nurse and I got a job. I kind of, I, I'd been to a doctor and I told, I've been told my liver was being, you know, my element, it's what's called elevated LFTs. And I responded to this news that my liver was being damaged by going on a bender. And I kind of realized that something bad was going to happen. So I went to Saudi Arabia, I got a job in Saudi Arabia as a nurse. And uh, it turns out it's the worst rehab in the world. <laughs> that there's no problem getting alcohol. When I, when I landed, one of the first thing they showed me was the illegal, the, the big kind of buckets full of this illegal alcohol that was much stronger than that never ever had before. And that caused basically nothing, and it was always available. So it was like, you know, after after being in, in Saudi for a few months, I realized it just wasn't going to work out. So I moved to Thailand. I basically moved to Thailand because I, I, I realized I wouldn't survive in, mm. in you know, in Saudi. And I, this was just, that was the second time, because I'd gone there before, as I say, with that, you know, um, last minute.com for about two weeks. But this was kind of, I moved over. I had no idea. What I was going to do. That was 2002. But my plan was was to to uh, move into a temple. I decided I, I tried so many different things to stop alcohol that by the time I arrived in Thailand, I decided that the solution was me to become a monk and meditate med meditate in a cave for the rest of my life because I felt like I tried everything else. Like I, I went to my first rehab when I was 20, but uh, I would go on retreats. Here in Thailand, I would I'd manage to stop drinking and I'd go on a retreat and you know stuff would happen on the retreat, but then I'd go out and I'd drink again. And that went on for, for a few years until I finally was able to stop. Um I'm and so I fascinated, Paul. I'm 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 fascinated to hear your story. When I talk about my uh, alcoholic past, sorry, shouldn't use stigmatizing words like that, but but you know what a lot of it is military based and it, it there was some fun times but of course we forget the painful times when it wasn't fun when we ended up fighting or getting hurt or hurting yes. innocent people or making idiots of ourselves. and um so i just want to kind of lay my table out here that i i'm biggest thing I say to people if you're unhappy in your life you've got to stop drinking even if you're having one glass of wine a night that is going to take you from your your superpower, you know, and rather than cruising up here and, and dealing with everything and, and enjoying it, enjoying life, you know, it, it absolutely it dumbs, it dumbs your connection with the universe. And this is not a lecture. If people want to drink, I did it for 30 years, you know, I still occasionally, you know. See, the thing about it is, you're absolutely right. You know, this is not about, I think it would be unfair to ask people to give something up that was working for them, that was enjoyable for them. And for some reason, you know, for some, for some people, maybe that's what it's doing. For a lot of it, it just, it just wasn't for me. It wasn't doing that. And I didn't give up alcohol to deprive myself. And I, I found out along the way that negative consequences weren't enough to get me to stop drinking. Because even, even the fear of death wasn't enough to get me to stop drinking. Because, yeah, it could get me to stop drinking for maybe a week or two. But eventually I go, what the hell? I don't, I don't actually care about living that much. So, you know, what I realized, it, it had to be about something else. And I realized that for me, and I think for a lot of people, Chris, they turn to alcohol for a reason. They're looking for something. And in the beginning, and I think it's, it, it's, um, it's a mistake to to label alcohol as always bad in the sense that when I first found it, it was, it seemed like miracle juice. It really seemed to be offering the thing I was looking for. I am, um, I had these memories of, of very early childhood where I had these real, real experience of joy, real deep experience of joy. And it wasn't about what was happening. I, I had a very, very normal childhood. Um, just, just these moments, like maybe lying on my grandmother's sofa or something, just these moments of intense joy. But as I get older, as a child, I st that stopped happening. And it was this sense of really missing that. And I turned to various things to get back to that. Actually, one of the first things I turned to was meditation. I got into meditation through my 
And I kind of realized there were moments in meditation where it did seem to be bringing me back to that. But I, it was very hit and miss. When I found alcohol, it wasn't hit and miss at all, at least in the beginning. You took it, job done. And I remember one morning, um, I must have been, I think I must have crashed in somebody's, he- somebody's house when I was about 15. I remember walking back in the morning and I just felt this incredible sense of not giving a shit. You know, that life was okay. And that's what I fell in love with. And it wasn't until I was able to get that without alcohol that I could give it up. And I think that's the problem. I think, you know, is to recognize why we do these things and to get those things in a better way. And once you do that, there's nothing to give up. You know, the problem is kind of identifying what it is that's attracting us to alcohol in the first place. Like to, to, to kind of really be able to be clear about that because what I found, and this is the amazing thing about those med- meditation retreats, is there's no, there's no state of mind that can't be created without drugs, that you don't actually need drugs to create those states. All of them. Yeah. Even, even, even the, you know, the ones like uh, hallucinogenics. You can do that in meditation and stuff like lucid dreaming. Mm. Like it's all, it's all available. And, and the, the, these incredible things that we can do with our perception. You, you know, one of the saddest things I've noticed with a lot of people is that we have this kind of very impoverished view of what's possible. So if you say to somebody, give up alcohol and you'll be happier, they may not have the ability to really imagine what that's gonna be like that they kind of have this, they have this, this perception of what it's going to be like not to drink alcohol and yet they'll be behaving better. And that's not going to really motivate them. It's, it's, you know, it's when you suddenly start to see that it's possible to, you know, experience a level of happiness and peace and well-being that we've never known before. That that's really what's, what's on offer. Mm. You know, who wants to give up something to be deprived? Yeah, exactly. This is the problem, isn't it? And, and I think when, when you stop drinking, it, it's absolutely fine when you're sort of, you know, you don't go out a lot. It, it, you know, the number of times I've sat on my sofa watching, you know, documentary with my, my girlfriend and it's like, oh my God, for 30 years, I would have sat here with a beer. It's just what I, it's what I thought if I didn't like I'm missing something and yet now I'm sat here just I'm perfectly fine in fact I'm actually better so what was that 30 years about what 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 was that about but the problem is that's great around the house but for me especially being in the military it's a lot about reunions you know there's a reunion next year and there's a you know, hundred guys going to be there that you haven't seen for 20 years. And, and I've done uh, like three, if not four, I think I've done three of these reunions sober. And two of them have got drunk. Um, the three sober always come off better. It's just the way it works. They, you know, yes. the, the, the outcome is always like better. Even just getting up in the morning, being able to jump in a car and drive home and not have the head and not, you know, not have the like right now I've got to write a day off or two days or a week or whatever it might be. Um, but it's still just that thing in your head, isn't it? You know, that's yes. conditioning, isn't it? Yes, it's conditioning. Um, sometimes I think, do you know what? I just don't enjoy being here, not drinking. I just want what. But then you have the drink, and you 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 end up just not enjoying that either. Yeah. So, gosh, kind of difficult. I mean, it is, and, and that's why people often struggle, and that's the things they fear. But but the thing is, I mean, I mean that's it's it, it is absolutely all true, and it is all all um you know it, it, it's, a, it's a 
point, you know, yet that these things are going to be difficult, but we, we often have no problem doing it if we have the right reason to. Like, you know, say you're ultra running or something, you know, I'm sure you, there's lots of things that you've had to give up to be able to do that. And you do that because of your vision. And that when we have a, a very strong vision about something, it's like, you know, um, like say when people become vegetarians, a lot of people become vegetarians. And you can kind of say, you know, it's changing now, obviously, but it's, it was often in a meat, a meat eating culture. Yeah. But these people weren't going around basically apologetic about it often. They, were, they kind of had pride in the fact that they were in what they were doing. Uh, sometimes maybe annoying how prideful they were about it. But that sense of, it, you know, there's something more important than, you know, I don't really care what everyone else is doing. I don't really care that I'm going against what everyone else is doing. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, you, you know, to me, the whole alcohol thing is ridiculous. I was listening to the, I listened to a few of your, your previous episodes and I was listening to that guy, the undercover drug guy. Yeah, and Neil, I, yeah. I, fascinating. But alcohol, absolutely. It's one of the worst drugs out there. And it's so normalized. And I think it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not against anybody doing any, you know, it's a, that's their business. But I think it's something incredibly sad that for a lot of us, that's all we had. You know, that this few points at the end of the day, that's all we really had. And I, I think it says something. I don't think it says something very good. And I, and I think buying into that and supporting that, I, I you know, I, I, I don't see it the way I used to. Let's put it that way. I don't think there's anything glorious about getting drunk anymore. Like quite the opposite. Yeah, we. When I'm sort of doing my life coaching bit, I try to get it across to people. Every, everything in your life is a lie. All of it. Yes. Your diet your religion, your, your big business, you know, your politics, um, your nutrition, you know, well, <laughs> lack of nutrition, you know, it, 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 until you see it for what it is. And when you're talking, you know, it's, it's almost quite hurtful, Paul, when you're talking, say to a fellow serviceman yeah. and they go, yeah, well, I've never done that drug shit. You know, okay, yeah, I mean, I like a, a bottle of wine and it's just like, it, you can't get it across to people unless they've experienced it, that alcohol is the worst drug, right? Absolutely. I've known loads of people take substances, you know, I've watched it for 30 years, right? I, I've, I've seen some terrible accidents, right? But they, they were accidents. Uh, but I've never seen anyone like die of a result. What I have seen is two of my best friends drink themselves to death, right? You know, one of them my age, my age, one of them was about six years older than me. And it's a hideous condition. Absolutely. You know? It could be hit, especially with liver failure and stuff like that. It's a horrendous death, you know, no, you, you see, Paul, you see people, if you go to the alcohol ward in your hospital, you'll see green people. Yes. Like they are green because their internal organs are packed up. And alcoholic induced dementia. Yeah. They've got a belly that's, you know, they look like the Michelin man because their their body's retaining fluid because it can't be, pre I won't even pretend I know the medical reason, yeah. right? And what do they say? Chris, you couldn't like have a word with a doctor so I can get out of here, can I? And yeah. they wanted I mean, when, I walked, I remember that when I walked as a nurse, I mean, we, we used to get, I worked in a gastrointestinal, like a intestinal ward, and we'd sometimes get in liver failure patients from drinking. And I remember there was one guy, and we were absolutely convinced he was going to die because his aside, we kind of had it was so bad, and his liver failure was so bad. But somehow we got him back. And the first, this is in, in the Royal London, in, in Whitechapel in London. We, we got him back and the first thing he did when he was well enough was, was, was got out of his bed to go across the road to a bar. Mm -hmm. And I would, have I would have said that was, you know, bananas, but I did, you know, I mean, when I was talking about my liver problem, that's the first thing I did as well. That's the only thing I knew what to do, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's horrendous. And, and that's the thing that, that alcohol can do that much to you and you'd still want to go back to it. Mm -hmm. You know what amazes me as well as I, you know, in regards to alcohol, and specifically, I, I often work with heroin addicts, 
And an idea they have was, but I'll still drink alcohol. But I, hold on a minute. You know, imagine if I had an alcohol problem and I says, yeah, but I'm just going to use heroin. You'd probably go, that's obviously a bad idea. Yeah. So why isn't it, the, what, what, it's this idea that alcohol is somehow, you know, okay. Well, a lot of that is stigma, right? I, oh, I, I worked as a substance misuse specialist. I've worked in a clinic for three years, right? And some of the stigma from the workers as well as the club, you know, and a lot of it comes from the old AA philosophies, right? And so you'll get people that it's like this they get obsessed with they i hate i hate to even use the word but they use the word clean right i fucking mm -hmm. hate that 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 expression right there's nothing dirty about having mental health problems we all have them right but this stigmatizing language comes from the stale 12 step program and the stale 12 step program uh, the, the the basic premise of their practice is if if you've got a problem with addiction that's it you're incurable you've got it for life just just throw your hands up to god or, or a higher power and just it well of course the problem is it, addiction is a learned psychological condition right it's our brain's reward mechanism you know it's like the rat in the in the in the, in the cage he hits the button he gets a food pellet right hits the button gets a food pellet you take the food pellets away what does the rat do he hits the button it's what his his brain has been conditioned to do and even when he doesn't get that reward what's he do pushes the button again and this is this is addiction isn't it it's it's doing the thing to get the reward long after the reward is really a reward anymore. But, but, I th but I think it's even more than that. I think absolutely that's the physical addiction, but it, it, I mean, and I think you've kind of alluded to it before. We buy into this whole way of looking at the world. You know, so th th this was what happened to me. Even when I would stop drinking, I would go to rehabs. And I remember I stopped for two years. I didn't stop being an alcoholic during those two years and not drinking. I still saw the world in those terms. And what finally happened for me, I, I not only gave up alcohol, I gave up being an alcoholic. I gave up, you know, seeing the world that way. Yes. And I never did anything afterwards to 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 not drink. I knew I knew when I left Tamkabok, the temple where I got sober, that I was never going to drink again. It was like my, you know, my 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 everything changed about me. In at least in regards to alcohol, I stopped seeing the world through that lens. I had a, a bigger vision. And what, well, you know, what really helped me was the, you know, the meditation retreat. And we kind of all have our own way of finding a vision, but the, that at least I saw that there was something else. And that was so incredibly important. And, and you're absolutely right. The way we view addiction does make a difference. I mean, but I'm, I'm happy for people to view it any way that helps them. Yeah. You know, good luck to them, whatever way. If that, you know, because some people, you know, it's a, it's a horrendous life. And, and if, if doing whatever they do that will help them escape that, you know, I'm, I'm all for that. But what really troubled me personally, and this is what, what I found was I kept on being sent back to the same thing, to the same resources. Even though I'd, I'd start to realize it didn't really work for me, like say that the, 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 that particular way of doing rehab that I went through, it didn't it wasn't it may have worked to me for a while but it, it stopped working and i remember being in thailand and i was absolutely desperate to stop absolutely desperate to stop and i'd contact people and i'd say i want to stop and they say okay you need to join this and do this this and this and i said well i've tried that and it didn't work for me and they said oh you just need to keep drinking I said, no, I don't need to, I need to quit drinking. I need different options. And, and, and thankfully I, I found different options that I found, you know, cause I, and I've kind of picked up these crumbs along the way, you know, I, I feel so, you know, for me, and I think it's different. I, this, I think this is the misunderstanding that there's one, one um, approach for everybody. I think that's a great misunderstanding. Yes. Can I just clarify, Paul, cause I don't want to upset anybody. Yes. If, if you're drinking yourself to death, as my two best friends did, right? Yes. Do what works for you. Get just get Absolutely. to the root. If you go to AA or, or, or NA, whatever your problem is, 
like it's going to get you on the road to education about what's you know it, it it's better than dying and it's better than you know having your family go go for all that 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 turmoil so it's not that wasn't really the point i'm making the point um i was saying is is everyone well, it's something that grabs a culture as the answer isn't there there, there's, there there tends to be one thing that, that that keeps on being betrayed as the as the as the answer yeah that and that and and the the problem that i came across was like if you don't understand the cycle of change mm. right you don't understand how human beings change and it's not natural i'm not saying it doesn't happen but it's not natural to just stop something one day bang as as you've said paul it took you years took yeah. me you know i drank for 30 years as a like a daily drinker on top of all the other stuff that I would do whenever it came yeah. along and I'm not knocking it, it, it I, I got no regrets right I did pretty freaking stupid things at times and I apologize to anyone that I that I unreservedly that I upset but the thing was after 10 years in fact no probably after 10 days right when you've gone into an off license at 11 o'clock in the morning and you've bought the super strong can on its own that that's a big clue when you buy the can yeah. on its own and you get you i mean you're not even pretending anymore i still do it now if i go in and grab a unfamiliar bit I, the first thing i look for is how much alcohol it's got you know what percentage is it right well what i'm trying to say is that was my warning so i'm not stupid that was a red flag that this isn't gonna be really helpful behavior chris right and from that point which like i say was probably 29 years ago it it took me 29 years to work it all out to slowly you know i i'd stop i'd stop for three months but i wouldn't really know why i was stopping i was just stopping because i knew this behavior was would ultimately yeah. kill me right and then i'd go back to it and then da -da 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 and 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 finally I got all the education together to at least get me in a position where I know it ha had to stop, right? Had to, there's no, there's no, right? It, it, especially when you're a father, you, you can't fuck around, you know, you, you've got yes. to have a, a clear plan and then you still might lapse and relapse because it's the cycle of change. That's, um, and my, my issue when working in a drug service is they have this dichotomy. You're either, clean or you're using and i was like what about people that find balance you know yeah and what about, i mean and there are people who are just never going to give up they you know and you meet people that's that's where they're at that's it's it's i would kind of call them these people that were quite happy to to to, to drink alcohol excessively and this had been going on for years and it seems almost cruel to not help them. That, you know, there's some people that that's their, you know, they're, they're, see my problem wasn't that I was drinking too much in the end. My problem was that I was drinking too much and didn't want to be. That was my problem. And I was, it's a, you're in this horrible place where you're doing something that you don't want to be. But I've got no right to, you know, someone who's doing something that they want to do. And at the end, for me, did, see, this was a thing, I, and, and I became so hopeless and so lost at the end with my drinking because I felt like there was this constant battle in my head of wanting to stop and not being able to. Mm -hmm. And I decided, you now, wouldn't it be great if I could just fully buy into alcohol, if I could fully commit to alcohol? Sure, it would kill me, but at least that war in my head would be over. We've all been there, mate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the same when I was addicted to crystal meth. It was, it, it was like, all right, I'm going to die a bit quicker, but mm. this is the life for me. This buzz, every, you know, getting yeah. stuff to, and of course, it all ends up going to ratchet. <laughs> oh, God. Had, had you done your, had you been doing your running and stuff before that? Was that a, a later thing? Um, 
I was always an awful runner, Paul, even in the military, you know, the Marines got some pretty tough tests there. I, I just did it by pure grit because I, you know, I came from, you know, I think we've both probably had a, ups and downs in our younger years. And I, I, for me, hanging in there and dying on a run was better than giving up and failing and going yeah. back, you know, and risking having to go back to nothing. Yeah. Um, but I was never like a runner and I'm still not now. You know, I just run 200 miles at Christmas. Get out of here. <laughs> like, please don't call me a runner or you're deluded, right? I don't know what you call it, but that's, I mean, so impressive. What yeah. you're doing. In fact, to be honest, it's it's these events, Paul, that that I step off the wagon for. Yeah. Because I get in so much pain that if I don't have a tot of rum in the morning when I set off, I I I, I mean I broke when I ran the length of the country, I had a shin splint in my right leg. So it's a stress fracture. I got a broken leg, right? And I've got to run 500 miles. And I don't suggest anyone else does this. Yes. I'm just very, very stubborn. And I, if I say I'm going to do something, I will, you know, I've, I've done the failure thing most of my life, right? I'm at an age now where like I want to achieve things, dude. Right? Yes. So, so I'm not suggesting any, anybody like follows my example, but um, what I will say though, to sort of answer your question is running has been part of that beautiful part of life that doesn't involve yeah. You know, it, I, I run 0.9 of a mile in the morning, not, not every morning, but four or five times a week. I purely do it for mental health, Paul. That is, you know, I, I, it's nice to get fit. You know, yeah. when I, when I did my 200 miler at Christmas, I, I built up a bit more. I did four 11 mile runs, right. All of which just killed me. Absolutely killed me. And I'm not good at it. I was the time when I checked my time, it was like I'd have had like my half marathon time would have been really rubbish, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a plotter. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a plotter is what I say. But like I say, I, I, I don't do it for the fitness. Although you can, I do get, I get faster because I lose so much weight doing it. You know, yes. I, I stick to my uh, alkaline green diet. Maybe. I think it's more for the adventure because that's what I find, I, I find, you know, so I just did my, my first 100K. And to me, it's more about the, it's just a journey. It's an adventure. Yes, 100K, that's awesome. Mm. It's a long way, mate, isn't it, you know? It's, I mean, and it's kind of considering, like, I, I didn't think I'd run again two and a half years ago because I used to take up running and stop running and take, and take it up and stop. But then what happened is I started, you know, and for years I meditated for six hours a day. So I was either meditating or sitting on the computer. And what happened is I was actually, I was actually t finding it hard to walk. I kept on getting injuries walking. And it was only my son took up running that I took it up again. And I just, you know, and I've re I just felt this real passion for it mm. to, to, you know, so I run like 10K most days and, and I'm kind of building up to these things. But just, it's just, it's like my body wanted to move. It needed to move. Yeah, that, and that's it. And when people say to me, oh, Chris, I don't like running, I say it's because you don't know how. Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't understand it. You think when I say I go running, you're thinking like that running for a bus yeah. or doing the cross country at school. We had, you know, back when I was at school, if you forgot your PE kit, they made you do it in your underpants. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how think if you did that now to a child, oh, you'd, yeah. put, you'd be put in prison. <laughs> but right and you had that thing i mean we used to stop for a fag in the woods <laughs> so our american friends that's a cigarette we used to just hide our cigarettes in the woods no, you're, you're, you're going to clarify that yeah yeah <laughs> um but yeah so when people say oh i don't like right it's like no you, you, you you're not you, that's not running being out of breath and 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 yeah, i mean yeah you can get out of breath running of course you can but what I mean is it's it for me, Paul, it's way it's 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 meditation. Absolutely. It's spiritual. Yeah. It's my connection being out, being out, you know, in the fresh air. I I you feel so good about yourself when you get those endorphins flushing yeah. to your brain. It sets you up for the day massively. Um, I do my videos if you're people in my Facebook group 
or uh, when I do my challenges, I do my video every morning. So I run, oh, yeah. I, I run my 0.9 of a mile and I don't stop talking. I bet they probably wish I did, right? Because it, it's the same boring, right? You know, I've got my basic philosophies of how to smash life. It's just simple. Gratitude, I smile at the sun every day. Take action, I jog around the block, you know, turn every negative into positive. Why? Because you can. You, you have that ability. It's, it's your choice, you know, just simple things like this. And part of that is my my little run in the morning. If I didn't work so much or maybe I need to start getting up earlier again, I, I could maybe run. Run more, but yeah. I for me, it's it's the lesser of two evils. It's like do something rather than nothing. Right. So. So, yeah, and I, I really kind of feel like with myself, um, the, the meditation, the, the, the same skills that I developed in meditation are absolutely make wonderful, make, make running so wonderful. Mm. That, it, that it, and this, this, this ability to really inhabit my, my body and to create these different ways of perceiving. One of the things I spent, one of the things that was very important to me, um, a, a big turning point in my life happened when I was about 14. And what it was, so it was down in uh, rural Ireland in a place called Cork. And I met this old guy, just a normal old guy. But I'd never met anyone who seemed so comfortable in their own skin. Who this guy oozed friendliness. And he was with his family, and it was obvious his family adored him. Mm. He, 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 was, um, he had a party in his house. That's how, how I, I met him. And it was obviously all his neighbors were just drawn to him. And I remember thinking, that's what I'm after. And I went a completely opposite direction. But it was all, I always, that was like a kind of a, a lighthouse, this idea of developing this sense of, of friendliness towards, towards life and towards other people and, and everything. And as part of my, my working as a nurse, I did a lot of agency nursing and I did a lot with palliative care, like care of the dying. And I was, ter I mean, I was suicidal for, for a lot of my life, but I was also terrified of dying. And so I was very obsessed with what, what led, how were some people so good at getting through that process, which I, I think may be the most difficult thing we ever have to face, especially if we, if we have to be told we're going to die and we have to go through that dying kind of thing with foreign audits. And some people, for some reason, do it incredibly well. They do it incredibly be beautifully. And to me, the, the, this, and it wasn't about religion. Well, there was no specific religion. There was no specific, um, you know, uh, social class. It was these people who were just, you could, they were friendly. They, they had this friendliness about them. And so one of the things I realized, that's what I, I needed to develop. And some people may be born with that, but I wasn't. But I, I was, especially when I was drinking, I was very, I was never physically aggressive because I wasn't big enough and I was a coward. But verbally, I was a nightmare. And just, you know, I, you know, looking back on my life, you know, I wouldn't change anything, but there's so much I kind of cringe at. So many times I, I fell out with people for no reason whatsoever. You know, just, just, just to be nasty, just for the sake of it. Just to, and it was such the opposite of what I was actually after. Kind of a two-way thing though, isn't it? Because, you know, I've fallen out with people, but that's because they're fucking assholes, you know? But, but you know what I found? But, but it's only when you're like in that uninhibited state <laughs> that you, re, you know, that, that, it, uh, what I'm saying, I think you can build up a lot of frustration about life. Oh, absolutely. The world. Um, I'm not trying to justify, like. Oh no! But what, what I realized myself was that that, that, that see the mistake, and, and I did, and I was like that. But I can't, see. I, I I misunderstood something. I thought that people had to be behave in a certain way for me to feel okay with them. And I realized that I don't. I mean, sure, there's people I prefer to be with and pe people that I'd rather necessarily, but I don't have to have any ill will towards anybody. And that when you, when you kind of have the sense of friendliness towards basically everyone, you're free of them. You don't need anything from them. That, you know, because otherwise we can kind of, we, we get lost in these, um, you know, I, what I see is, 
I deal with a lot of people with trauma, like long-term trauma. And they can have a person in their head who they think about more. And, and they may not have seen this person in 20 years, but they think about them more than they do the people they love. Oh, that is, that's a, a big factor of addiction, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things I had to reconcile myself or get my head around was I, I was spending all day thinking about, it was almost like an imaginary then. Yes. You know, almost like a persecution or some form of persecution complex. And then, and people do that. You see it in people. It's like, well, stop a second. What about the five mates that are loyal to you? The ones that call you? What about, you know, the ones that come and see you or your family? Okay, they may not be perfect. Very few families are, but like they will try and bail you out if you and you're ignoring them and you're wasting all this precious life energy on on an imaginary. Well, that guy might be like this or said this or it's. Yeah, and it's like we get stuck, and, and you're right, and we can't see what's in front of us because we're, we're kind of lost with the baggage of the past, and it's horrendous. And so I, I kind of what I realized, you know, with myself, and I was very much like that, so bitter about so many things. One of the things I, I've done a lot of work with dreams, you know, nighttime dreams, and I was always fascinated by by why was it? You know, if I, you know, if I was on a beach in a dream. It somehow felt more satisfying than a beach in real real life. And for ages going, what the hell is going on? Like, why, why would a dream beach be more satisfying than the actual beach? Mm. And I kind of realized that when I was on a beach in a dream, I was fully there. But when I was on a beach in real life, I wasn't, I was only kind of half there because I'd be thinking about what I'm going to be doing after the beach. I mean, I might have memories of my, my last time on the beach. I just, I was never able to kind of fully give myself to that experience of being on a beach. And, and that's what happens to a lot of us. We're, we're basically dragging all this baggage around with us from moment to moment. Like things that happened years ago. And it's not that we choose it. It's not, it's not that our, we want that to be happening, but it's like we get stuck in it. We, we get stuck and no one teaches us how to get unstuck. Yes. Did you find that about alcohol as well is when you're living that life, it consumes your thoughts 24 seven? Yes, of course. Well, certainly from the moment you wake up. It's I mean, a full time job. <laughs> yeah, for 30 years, the second I open my eyes in the morning, it's like, what am I going to drink today? Where am I going to buy it? When am I going to buy it? How much money am I going to spend on it? How soon can I start? You know, I mean, I, I've never like a chronic sort of guy. I just, I just, yeah. it's just, I just, I would have said, oh, I like drinking beer and, and it, it did me really well. You know, I love traveling the world, most yeah. of which I've had to do on my own because it's difficult to get people to follow your, you know, your, your dreams. And I also love sitting in an airport. I mean, I, I mean, I never even sat in the airport lounge. I'd, I'd buy some tinnies from the supermarket and I'd, yes. I drink them before I went through to the departure lounge. You know, I'd yeah. sit in the, you know, it was just what I did for so, so long. I just and it's so unglamorous. I, I, I mean, I, I was living in a Thai village for the last few years of my drinking, and I'd send pictures to people, uh, you know, of this amazing, you know, this amazing village and in the jungle. But actually, my day was nothing like that. You know, m my day very much depended on my ability. I used to drink these bottles of Leo. This beer called Leo was cheaper than Chang even, I think, at the time. Or no, maybe not. But I, don't, I got it for some reason. Anyway, I used to drink that one. And my, my, the state of my day depended on my ability to get about three bottles into me for breakfast. Mm. And if I couldn't do that, and often I couldn't because I, I'd vomit and stuff. I just literally couldn't consume it anymore. I would spend the day rattling. If I could get those first three down, then we were okay, you know, because I could keep keep myself topped up over a day. And that was the life I was living in this kind of tropi tropical paradise. Crazy, isn't it? Yes. And it, it's just such a... Go on, Chris. No, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm very conscious, you know, we've um, we've talked a lot about the alcohol, but your, your whole story is fascinating. I mean... Your book is is a quite an emotional cover, isn't it? You are 
seen that picture and so for people who are just listening who haven't seen Paul's book cover it's somebody basically lying in a semi-state of consciousness face down on a beach surrounded by bottles of out al- empty bottles of alcohol yes with the beautiful is it the monastery in the background you know as that's kind of the the I, th- I think the dead drunk one so that is that they're drunk yeah yeah so yeah it's, it's, it looks on the beach I, I, that is that wasn't me that was the publisher who did that photo but it really summed it up well y- your book cover pool is um yeah it it's it just that image conjures up or like this almost like the sad patheticness of yeah of that such you know the hopelessness of that situation the desperateness um i mean done well to rescue yourself mate haven't you well that's it and you know in, in one way alcohol giving up alcohol was a key part of my life but it's also I'd like to think the least significant. In that, it, it is about what happened after that, mm-hmm. and it is about you know this. I, I found this incredible joy, this incredible way to be with life. That you know, it's been tested. You know, that it, it, it's not a wishy-washy thing. It, it's something. See, I, I this idea, as I said, it about living in a temple and living in a cave and meditating, and would have been all perfect. But the real, the real challenge has been able to be in life and find peace in life. Because that can be just another form of escapism. Like for a long time, my, my goal with meditation was to somehow slip off and do a kind of bliss cloud forever, <laughs> which is very similar to, to drug addiction. <laughs> yes. But it's this ability to kind of, to, to be okay with life, to, to, to be able to fully embrace life and to see how incredible life is. What an amazing, I, I'm, I'm stunned at how us humans can take it for granted. Everything is just like, it's just, you know, we've got a big sun in the sky. You know, this boring thing and we just think, we just go, oh yeah, sun. <laughs> Yeah. But the fact that we're experiencing anything is, is mind-blowingly. I, I saw this video a, a while back, and it was a 90-year-old uh, philosopher. I can't remember the exact details, but he's a 90-year-old philosopher. And when he was 60, he wrote a book about dying, where he said, I think he kind of said something you know, along the lines that it wasn't that big of a deal. But now he's 90, and his life has really deteriorated. Um, you know, he, his, his lifelong partner is dead and he's basically now fully dependent on other people. And now he doesn't want to die. And I don't think it's, you know, from listening to him, it's not because he's afraid of dying, really. It's just, he's just suddenly realised how precious life is. Mm. How every moment is a gift. And this is the thing with alcohol, this idea that we have to take a chemical to be okay with it. And I'm not saying everyone does that, but I, I did. And it's just such a, an insult to, to, to life because it, it can be this incredible experience. And it, it's not that we, it's not that we you know, necessarily have to do anything miraculous to, to, to see that because it's already like that. And I think people do get a hint of that. Sometimes we're in nature and you get a hint of that. But it's just kind of, you know, we've got a pretty good deal. Life is, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we would we prefer to be different. But really, life is an incredible deal. Yeah. There's an incredible amount of joy to be had. The problem is, again, that, Paul, though, isn't it? That it, it's this thing I'm saying about we've been lied to from birth. Yes. We've been told that we're ugly. Yeah. That we need to have these size blooming breasts or, mm. you know, this size biceps. Yeah. We've been told we need to earn this amount of money. That if you not if you you know if you're not driving a, a Mercedes and got a Cartier on your wrist, and you're not quite as good as this other yeah. person in life because he's got them and he's you know all that not you know not knowing that actually no these are the most of them are sociopaths and they're unhappy and they're just power crazy monsters. Um, because you, you, you never see a rich person with a drug problem, do you? Well, yeah, they're too. <laughs> <laughs> As if that's the answer. Yeah, it's um, 
it, but it's you never see unhappy, unhappy rich people. They they're all they're all loving they're all loving their lives, aren't they? Well, when you see these aging businessmen, I say age, you know, they're in there, they're like forty five, and mm. and they got red braces, and they're out here because they've just sat behind a desk all their life and moved from the desk to their liquid lunch and back again. Yeah. It's nothing to aspire to, is it? Oh, no. Give me someone who does kickboxing in a Thai monastery. Any, no. any, you know. Give me someone that smiles at the sun and says, "Thank, thank you, universe." You know. I think I mean, something. It's something. It's something. I remember now George Harrison once said, "You know, he really he said it when he, the Beatles first became really big." I think he said something along the lines, "He wished everyone could be rich and famous, so he could see it wasn't the answer." <laughs> yes. Yes. So the alcohol thing is. You know, we we're in a we got a veteran suicide epidemic at the moment, yes. right? I, I'm 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 guessing it's always that's what your run was for, wasn't it? Yeah, I I try and do my bit, Paul. You know, I to be honest, it's it, 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 I I'm just glad that I can show people if they're struggling that there is another way. But yes. the, but but the the issue there is like in life. We have all these in programmed expectations yes. programmed into us. And they're other people's expectations when you look at them. They're making other people rich. They're yes. making their dream, you know. These sociopaths that control us, they want everyone to be as unhappy as possible. Because what do unhappy people do? In a capitalist society, they buy thinking that that is yeah. going to bring them happiness, right? Absolutely. That's every every advertisement is based to make us feel stressed, so that we yeah. want that. Yeah, make us all these magazines to make young women feel ugly, so they'll go and you know, da 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 da. We'll all be more. And there's two there's two ways of kind of dealing with that. What I've kind of realised: either we can try to stop it, which I don't think is feasible, or we can wake up to it. And I think the only the only feasible thing that I could do was wake up to that, mm -hmm. and to also realize, you know, that I don't think there's any way for a human being to be in the world that doesn't involve at least some level of delusion. In order to kind of get something to fun to get things to function, we kind of have to agree to things that are only like all of our laws, all of our our things that we take for granted. Somebody came up with that. People people just like you and me came up with that. And yeah. we all kind of join in and we all kind of, I, I, I don't buy into the fact that it's, it's very well organized. I don't believe there's a kind of malicious group that it's that well organized that it's kind of controlled. I think it's just human stumbling trying to, to get to this thing. It's got to be the yin and the yang, surely, um, is that these, these problems and these pressures are they're nothing new that, that go... It probably goes back to the point where we started thinking, we started to have these, the ability to think, which the animals don't. I mean, I know animals think, but you know, this ability to be introspective and look at ourselves, which an animal doesn't do because it just looks yes. for food, looks for a mate, you know, as the odd fight chills out, right? But, but at some point from that point forward, we've had all this, you know, this must be what the Adam and Eve story in the Bible is a bit about, right? It, Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I kind of get that as well. This, yeah. that, that's what it is. I mean, the tree of knowledge, we suddenly became self-conscious. We suddenly realised we're naked. And absolutely, there's just, there's just theory. I remember one theory is that, you know, the Bronze Age collapse. That up until that point, that communities were very, very kind of close-knit. But for various reasons, there's this huge, like, huge change, and it meant that we had to much more engage with other people, with strangers. Mm -hmm. And it's that engaging with strangers that made us think more. Because suddenly, you know, if you grew up in, a, say, a little village, you kind of had a good idea where everything, you know, who, you know how everything was. Mm -hmm. But when you're faced with strangers, you have to try to figure out what did they think of me? What did they think about anything? So you're kind of, it's this whole new level of thinking and a whole new level of being self-conscious. So yeah, I think it kind of, that, that's what happened. And maybe that story of the Garden of Eden is a wonderful way of describing that process. And I've oft, I often actually use that. I wouldn't consider myself a Christian, but I do. It's a wonderful story. Yeah. 
I think going back to the the suicide epidemic, Paul, when the the because you know if we if we think of alcohol as self medication, it's people medicating themselves, doping yes. them into a state of of sort of false happiness, stroke stupor. Yeah. Get over the fact that life it's not meeting their expectations, right? When and what I try to do in my runs and and all my work is say fuck those expect that they're other people's fuck them make yeah. your own rules you know absolutely make your own rules right so long as you've got somewhere to lay your head at night you can smile right you know if if even if something bad happens to people you love it you you can choose how you deal with that to to a degree you know yeah. You can either be one of these people that's just, oh, my God, and woe is me. And I'm going to tell everybody on Facebook that my great, 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 great granddad Bert has just died. And he was taken far too young. <laughs> and I will never forget. It's like, come on, dude, you get the fuck over. We, we've all got to die. Bert did quite well. Right. You know, like if that's the worst thing in your life then you're basically i'm not talking about loss here you know loving yeah. missing I, I think you know what i've realized as well and I'm, not, I'm sure you do as well it's not what happens to us that's the thing it's how we interpret what happens to us yeah so i was very very sensitive as a kid and so things that maybe other people would have brushed off like my, my, my parents splitting up i was absolutely devastated i couldn't cope with it i was absolutely but somebody yeah yeah and, and I, so it's not always what happens to us mm. And it doesn't even have to be true. You know, we, we may have misunderstood something and it traumatizes us. It's kind of our, it's our interpretation of what's happening. And, and, if, and what I found as well, if we have a certain kind of uh, bent, if we have a kind of certain level of negativity, we can be much more easily kind of hurt by things and they can really kind of destroy us. Yes. And, and so you could say to somebody, oh, you know, this happened to me and this happened to me. And they go, that's nothing, but it is to them. <laughs> and they may not even be able to explain it properly how much it hurt them. It's kind of, it's always this kind of error interpretation. You know, this idea of nature versus nurture. Yes, very much. You know, that, that it is both and our kind of, our nature is maybe our, our, our sensitivity to things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know don't want to talk about my history too much i just don't want to talk about it it's not not i don't i'm not against it or anything i am got nothing to hide it's just i don't when you do podcasts it's going to become quite boring if i always talk about and there's other stuff like i'm, I'm a great believer in forgiveness so absolutely you know if someone either says they're sorry to me or they through their actions i know that this is their way of saying as far as i'm concerned, that's done you know we're all human we make mistakes all we can do is say sorry and make and, and then change well you know you know what i found with a lot of people the hardest thing is self-forgiveness and that's the, 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 this is the big thing with addiction you know i i honestly believe for a long time that was the best that was what i deserved that i didn't deserve a better life and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, Paul, isn't it? Because the more you, the more you get drunk, the more you do stupid things that you regret, then you have exactly worse self-image. And, and that's why that's why I kind of say to people about forgiveness: you have to forgive yourself because you're just going to, you know, if you don't forgive yourself, you're actually increasing the likelihood you're going to hurt people in the future. Mm. You know, it's not it's not a luxury item. You know, in order to, and and when we kind of start to understand ourselves, you know, people. People who were in a, I, was, I watched another of your, your yeah, no, it's the same video about that guy, the undercover policeman. He said about that woman, you know, I could see him getting emotionally upset that, that heroin oh. used to pounds. And I could kind of see, yeah, because she'd had it, she, she felt okay at that moment. She'd taken her fix. And when people feel okay, they behave better. When people don't feel okay, they're not able to behave better. It's like they have fewer limited options to, to behave. And that's when we tend to hurt people. Like happy people don't go around hurting people generally. No, very much, you know. What we like when we got a hangover, you know, we're awful to the people yeah. around us, aren't we? We just become this stuff that you just ordinarily argue, you know, that's not worth, yeah. you know. This per I like know. Losers. 
I love this person too much to worry about a plate left on the side. Or and then when you've got that bad head, yes, suddenly becomes like a relationship changer. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. And you kind of see it's like, like that. That's that. You know, sure. You know, we have to we have to take the consequences of our actions. There's no getting out of that. And 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 you know, and, and I don't think we should escape the consequences of our actions. But this, this self-hatred and blaming ourselves over things that we've done, it's just unfair because it's very easy when you're in a good state of mind to say what you, you should have done when you were in a bad state of mind. But you weren't in that state of mind. This is where the, kind of, the Buddhist idea of emptiness is very important. That we, we have this sense that we're always on the top of our game. We're always making these very clear decisions, but we're simply not. Some days we don't have the power to make to make a, a, even a rational decision. Mm. Paul, just one second. Yeah, Paul, let's get get into that a bit because um, I I read a lot, right? But I'm not the most well read on probably the books that I probably find fascinating. So all my philosophies is just stuff like I've worked out. You know the. the uh, uh, I think when you listen to people um, like John St. Julian, for example, I don't know if John's still on YouTube. I haven't seen him for a while, but he's very good at explaining the scriptures and what the esoteric story is, not the physical yeah. story, what, what this story is meant, meant, to, meant to represent, right? And yeah. for example, like when you hear the word prayer in the Bible, it actually means meditation, right? It's what the, they called meditation. So... What I'm interested to ask you is, say, for example, is it the Bhagavata? No, that's more Hinduism. That's Hinduism, right? Have you read that? I've, I'm, a, I'm aware of things from it. And okay. I'm aware of the kind of culture around it, but I've, n I've never sat down with it now. Yeah. Are you able to do any kind of synopsis on it? Because I, I, I've got it on my shelf. Yeah. Do I have time to read it? Not, not yet, but yeah. I will. I'm not because like, it's kind of, I was kind of more drawn towards Buddhism and towards Taoism. Yeah. For most of my life. Um, which, which were kind of inspired by that same culture, but it, it maybe goes in a, in a different direction. And in regards to kind of Buddhism stuff, um, I'm, m my loyalty is to well-being. And I will use whatever works and mm -hmm. um, i'm not i'm not and I, I think that this is one of the nice things about i think buddhism at least my understanding of buddhism is that the you know that the, the buddha was very clear about that that you know his teachings were just the raft it's just to get you from a to b it's not to you know become obsessed with the teachings they're just they're, it's a practical thing and i'm only i think a mistake i used to make is i, I get re i buy into something and i forget what i was actually came for and for me, the only thing that matters is this thing I call well-being, is to be okay. And yeah, you know, Hinduism, I don't care what it is with Christianity. I, I kind of fell out with Christianity as a, as, a, as a young kid. But now as I'm older, I, you know, my grandmother used to have her, have her rosary beads. I, 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 I tend to use these mala beads. I'm almost like copying her, <laughs> you know, that I don't... I don't have that anger anymore. And I can kind of see that there's many, many different paths to this thing that, you know, this well being. And you kind of see it in people and, and from all different types of the different paths. Mm. It does something for them. And the, the Buddhism's an easy one to, I mean, well, I, I don't know how maybe people watching you can leave me a comment how well you understand it. To, I don't know if it's because I've traveled a lot and I've you know i've got an interest in this area that to me it just seems obvious you know you got this prince born into incredibly wealthy background his only known privilege he literally didn't know that outside of the palace walls there was like babies dying in poverty and and and, and so he takes himself on this journey and goes i think it's something we can all identify with and like, even though we may, we may not have been princes I think a lot of us, we did have that idea that, you know, by our teenage years, that with this idea that life wasn't going to cut it, that the life that was being presented to us 
just wasn't somehow going to work for us. And I think that's the exact same thing that, say, the Buddha recognized. The only difference is maybe you and me went to a bar yeah. <laughs> and we went to a forest. We went it's the exact to, same thing. We went to more than one bar, mate. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> we should have bought one. <laughs> but maybe it led to the same place. I mean, you know where uh, William Blake? The writer. Uh, the Englishman. Yes. Well, he was a visionary. He was lots of things. He was an artist, but a very incredible Englishman. He wrote that, that, that song, Jerusalem. But he oh, had this I love that song. Yeah, he wrote that. But he had this wonderful saying, the fool who follows his folly becomes wise. That if, if you keep on doing that crazy thing long enough that you're doing, eventually you'll wise up. Yeah. I mean, he should have added an extra sentence on saying, assuming you live that long. Yeah. Yeah, or well, when your liver starts to blow up, then then you've, you've followed your folly enough at that point. Yes, but some people just keep on going, but yes. So what kind of um, uh, philosophies, strategies, practices did you do in this in this monastery? What, what was so it there was two, two, main, two main practices that, that I did in the beginning was one was Vipassana and the other was what's called Metta or uh, cultivating friendliness. So with Vipassana, you know, you can kind of say the goal of Vipassana is to see how our normal way of perceiving is deluding us. That, that, that basically we, you know, we, we see things in a way that isn't how things are. That our mind does all of these kind of shortcuts to create this sense of things being a certain way, but that's not really how things are at all. And this is very important because see, a lot of people, they, they can change the reception very, very temporarily. So say, you know, I, I think I may have heard you mention, say, something like Anthony Roberts, that somebody can watch one of his videos maybe and get really motivated. But there can be this tendency to just keep on returning to their old way of looking at things. And it's a problem a lot of people have. It's just like it's, it's easier to go back to the old way of looking at things. So what Vipassana is about is seeing how that's delusional to, so you can break free of it. And once you're able to break free of that way of perceiving, because you, you start to understand how the mind has tricked you, it's like the, it's like the mind is constantly brainwashing us or hypnotizing us into seeing the world a certain way. So say if we're negative, it's kind of constantly, we're constantly kind of talking to ourselves and talking ourselves down. And we mistake that for how life actually is. Once we see that, no, that's, that's not how life is. That's just a way of perceiving that's become habitual. We can break free and stay free. And so the other thing is actually practicing other ways of perceiving. And one, so one example of a way of perceiving is this friendliness. Outside of this, but there's also kind of, I found there's also really very, very other important ways for me to perceive that I kind of, once I knew that, once I'd kind of done that, I, I kind of developed this ability to kind of move into other perceptions. And one that was important to me that you seem to kind of have already, but I didn't have, I was quite timid in regards to a lot of things. And I could have said, oh, well, that's just the way I am. But I kind of actually investigated and I found that wasn't true. I, I, I worked as a, as a freelance writer for about seven years. And at one point, every, I, I nearly lost everything. I just ran out of clients. And my, old, my timid way of seeing things was to just, I basically went into a downward spiral. I never thought about drinking again, but I did think about jumping off a cliff. And I just could not think straight. But I managed to kind of ground myself by focusing on, 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 the, on the body. And what happened was this image came up of a warrior. And I automatically got what, it was, what that was. That was a completely different way of perceiving the situation. That Because a warrior would actually love this. I kind of like this kind of warrior spirit or salesman spirit that they would go, you know, when things go to crap, they go, yes, bring it on. And that I could just suddenly flip into this completely different perception. And suddenly rather than this thing, you know, defeating me, it was this incredible, it was this challenge. It was this, because you kind of realize, you know, if I'd have been, you know, if I'd have been a caveman, I wouldn't have been leaving the cave, I'd have been too afraid. 
I had to kind of see this different way of perceiving. And before that, I would have said, well, no, you, you kind of are the way you are. That's bullshit. We can actually train ourselves to perceive in completely different ways. And, you know, so this kind of warrior spirit that, that, that is you know, from the stuff I've seen in you, you seem to be very much about in, in many ways. It's something maybe you're, you're more gifted towards it. You know, from very whether that's nature or nurture, who knows? But it may not be as ex just exclusive to you. That the rest of us may have to work harder, but that it's possible for anybody if we work with that particular way of proceeding. And also, I think we need to recognise it to a degree, or even completely. It, it's image. It, it, this might be an image I give off. Yes. But when we actually break it down, I use the word warrior a lot at the moment. I, I do it for effect, Paul, more than anything. You know, you do well. I, I, I want young people to realise if you walk, walk around with your pants halfway down your ass doing this all day, right? You are not helping the situation because these sociopaths yeah. that, that, you know, they've They've got us. We, we need people to step up to the mark now mm. and say enough is enough. Right. I, let's not mention any names of things or anything, but everyone knows what we're talking about. Right. You know, if you get your information in life from the BBC News or Sky, right, you are not being helpful. You, you, you are, in effect, the, the enemy of, of mankind. Right. You need to stop doing that. You need to start reading books. Warriors read books, believe it or not, right? It's probably the biggest thing they do. Any warrior culture will, will be very well read. You know? but, uh, but also keep in mind I mean, this is, that there is no such a thing as unbiased. There is only bias. There, there's no other show in town. So, yeah. see, 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 I think it's very easy to kind of say, look, and say, oh, that media, that's... Um, that, that's that's obviously kind of playing us in a way it's manipulating us mm. and that's true but to go from there to saying that this blog isn't that to me is a bit see we can kind of go see once we're deluded once we wake up to the fact that we're deluded it's very easy to to run into a new delusion mm. and this is one of the things that troubled me about buddhism in the beginning you know when i was a kid i kind of recommend i, I recognized the problem or what i thought was a problem with Buddhism. And what it was, was this story of the Buddha waking up. And this troubled me because obviously he woke up to the fact that he'd been deluded. Yeah. Now, if you've got a history of being deluded, why would you assume that you're not deluded now by a fancier delusion? Mm -hmm. But the Buddha didn't say that, you know, from my understanding, all, all ways of perceiving, there is, that delusion is the only game in town. And it's about whether it's skillful, whether this helps us or not, whether this particular way of looking at things enhances our life, aids our life, that's all that matters. And we need to kind of, you know, for me, and this is only for me, I, I had to forget about what's true. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what's true. I've got no idea what's true. And to be honest with you, I don't care what's true. I care about what works, what's, what brings well-being, what brings peace. That's the only thing that's important to me. And I don't hold out for some truth, for someone that's, that has the unbiased information, because we're human beings. We don't have any other ability to give than a biased point of view. And, and, and there's, no, there's no other show in town mm. across the board. There's no, one, there's no one out there telling the truth. There is no truth. There's only there's only different ways of looking at things, and I think that's so important. And because otherwise we're just going to shout at each other forever. See, see, like what I found as well is that if I listen to people, because we all we all have our conditioning, that if I listen to people, I could become very offended by their views, by what they were saying. But if I listen to why they were saying it, I didn't. I found it's this real commonality that we're actually kind of all on the same side. We're all trying to be okay. We just have different opinions about how to go about that. Yeah. 
it's complicated. It absolutely is. I mean, I don't think we're going to get started on this on this, this show at all. I agree with you for the most part. Yeah, people are people and everywhere I've traveled, all this uh, 87 countries we discussed earlier, Paul, you, for the most part, I met wonderful, lovely people. I've met some people with funny ideas. The guy that gave me his pistol in Pakistan and said, have a shoot of that. And as I'm shooting his pistol, he went, yeah, I shot my wife in the face with that one. Yeah. Oh, why was that? Oh, she wanted to divorce me. <laughs> you know, so... I watched but, your other show. I, I think I watched about three of your podcasts. And I also watched one of the ones with the UDA guy, the guy that was in the UDA, or yes. support, support guns. Very interesting. Mm. And one of the things I don't know, and I don't mean to offend him in any way, but I just had this sense that if he fell into with a different crowd of lads, he could have easily ended up on the other side. Oh, my God. Yeah, this is the whole thing. But what we're talking here... And what I fundamentally see as the problem, Paul, is I think there's an enemy in society. And I think I know... Well, maybe it's is. us. Well... And, and, and hopefully it's us, because if it's, if, it's, if it's not us, we can't really do very much about it. Well, from a philosophical... And I don't mean that as a weird bad, but I mean that if, the prob if we are the problem... From a philosophical point of view, I, 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 I wish that... You know, I'm, I'm not saying it's not true. Yeah. But I wish it was. I wish that the fight was in our head yeah. and the answers in our head. And to an extent, you know, we all know that that, that, that that's true. But no, I when, when I look at my beautiful son mm. and I look at what certain elements in society are trying to do to his future, I, I can't accept it, right? Yeah. I, I cannot accept it. I think it's quite clear who these individuals are. It's quite simple. You look at the events in the world and then you extrapolate back who created them and, and why. Yeah. And who stood, you know, like Hunter S. Thompson, wasn't it? If you want to understand who who gains from these events, look, look who look who profits from them. It's it's yeah. you know and and Look, I'm, I certainly don't profess to have all the answers, but what I'm seeing is a systematic destruction of my culture, right? Mm. And I'm a, all for one, one for all. That, that's fine, but I've also been in countries where if they see a, you know, 16-year-old blonde girl wearing a skirt, they think it's okay to rape her because she's asking for it, right? And mm. this is a fact of life, you know. It's it's this is why we travel, isn't it? To 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 to, to learn such things, right? Um, and instances in my city where gangs of men gang rape uh, young kids with learning disability because mm. there's no, you know, I won't get into the whys and wherefores, but yeah. you you get. Yeah, you know, let's just say a I don't know a fifteen year old girl who's not not quite got it all up top that suddenly gets into one of these groups and they just do what they it's and and we're not supposed to complain about this and when it goes to court it gets you know we get these like three month suspended sentence it's okay. it's pretty clear we're under systematic attack here in the UK. On, on everything that we, you know, on everything that we know, Paul. Right? We've got mass immigration, whether it be legal, illegal, or asylum. But it, you know, it, it it's coming in, and and it's 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 controlled. Mm -hmm. There's these companies cropping up, like the Serco and the Capita, that is just all the stuff of bloody, yeah, an Orwellian nightmare. Yeah. We've now got basically one shop that anyone can go to with any guarantees. It's called Amazon, right? Because we're all locked in our homes. We're illegally mm. locked into. There's nothing wrong with us, right? But but it's somehow been uh, skewed to the healthy people that eat alkaline diet and haven't been ill for 17 years. I, I'm yeah. now a danger to. Oh, uh, it, it, it now. Let, let me put it to, the, to the, this way from, from, from where I am with all of this. See, I, I had my time of being political when I was younger. 
Mm. And I got kind of really drawn into the whole socialist thing when I was younger, very young. But I kind of worked out that that wasn't what was going to help me. That for me personally, and, and it goes back to, you know, and maybe this is because of who I am, that the, the, I, I kind of personally, this is for me, Chris, for me, it, it's more like that man I talked about, and that old man I met when I was a kid. It's more about me, you know, becoming this kind of, this thing, this benefit to other people that would maybe, I, I think it's one of the, the Buddhist teachers at Thich Nhat Hanh, I think it was, he talked about when you were leaving Vietnam and there'd be people panic, panicking on the boats. And all it took was one person being really, really calm to calm everyone else down. And I think we need people like that. I, I, I really do. And that's where my emphasis is. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm very, very cynical about politics, but that could be just me. But I, I really feel that if I can't sort myself out, I, maybe I don't have any business pointing outside because a lot of the stuff that's happening outside happen. Like we, we are, we can be the biggest hypocrites inside our own minds. We, we can be the biggest yeah. self-deception. And if we're, you know, and if we, if, if we can't deal with our own self-deception, I mean, how, how effective are we going to be at pointing out deception outside? That we, it's going to have to be come from ourselves. And that's just me. And, you know, I could be wrong. And, and obviously you don't see it that way. Or maybe well, you, you maybe see it a bit, a bit of that way. It, it's maybe that I see some of it or I understand all of it, but I don't. You know, I mean, like I, personally, like, like growing up in Ireland as well, I, I got really disgusted as a kid with nationalism. I, I found the whole thing quite disgusting. Um, yeah, personally, I I went off at someone last night, and we had a we had a Q and A. <laughs> yeah. I went I went off a bit when a good friend of mine in the Q and A. This is with my 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 YouTube channel members uh, start to talk about the the Trump and the Biden, and I'm like, guys all the time you think along these lines that any of these sociopaths care about you you're buying into their game right i i've never voted paul i i i, I, I've, I've, I voted about, once in my life and i'll probably upset some of your viewers but I, I voted once in my life and it was for labor oh sorry you came in sorry i did vote once i voted green party because the guy i live with dan hello dan he put himself up as a candidate and I'm a loyal guy. And when he said, Chris, would you vote for me? I'm, of course I will, mate. You know, it, I one vote isn't. But so I don't do politics, mate. I this, um, you know, I don't ascribe to any kind of um, economic system or, or system of control, whether that's capitalism, communism, what, what, whatever. I, 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 you know, I think there's probably good ways that we can go about managing our global communities in, in view of, you know, the fact that we're ever developing in this kind of thing. But, but now it's, unless I'm very much deluded and I'm really missing maybe the point. Well, well, well maybe we're all deluded. Maybe that's a, in the world, what's it? In the world, but not of the world. Well, in yeah, that's like a connection with the universe, right? Is that what that refers? Well, 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 well to kind of that, that, that basically to to realize that the answer is in the, in in the world, and that that maybe it just moves from different kinds of being messed up. Maybe that's all it ever will do, and to not look for what the answer the, there. What was the one time in the Bible when Jesus lost his temper and he got angry and he got physical with yeah. people? The, the money lenders, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an expert in Christianity. Yeah, but I imagine the money lenders. lenders out of the temple, yeah, yeah. right? It wasn't yeah. that they were using God's house to do their, you know, their misdeeds. And, and look, maybe people, maybe there are people that need to do to do that, and but I'm not one of them. I mean, and I, I can't, I can't speak to that. Like we can't speak. I think any of us can speak to everything. And I don't think any of us, and this is why I, I kind of have the same conversation. Um, I, I, I'm, I don't tend to focus on the practicalities of, of kind of whether I should do this, whether I should get back at my girlfriend or leave my girlfriend or, you know, leave my job. I don't deal with that. I deal with how we relate to all of that. 
because I, I found that peace can be there regardless of that. That there's people, I, I kind of realized that there's probably people in the middle of a war zone who are happier than I was. And that that's what's important for me. That the rest of it, I can spend my life, you know, trying to, to fix the world. And maybe it will make a difference, maybe it won't. But I need to do something now. And, 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 I, and I don't think they're necessarily separate. There's some people who, who will find, you know, a deep level of peace within and go on to have an incredible positive effect on the world. I've no doubt about that, but we're not necessarily all called to that. We're all kind of called to different things. You know, personally, I'm, I feel called to working with people, with individuals, not with societal change. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad when something does positive, I'm glad there's people out there that are called, called to that. But it just isn't my area. And you may, you may think, well, hold on, well, you have to get involved that you have to care. Well, no, I don't. I, I really don't. That it, we, 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 we are can't you, all... Are you a, can I ask, are you a father, Paul? Yes. Do you, how did, I mean, you know, how do you feel about it for the way, for the future, for our kids? I mean, well, all, I mean, all, all I can everything. do for my son is, is show him, you know, I can only show them what I what I what I've done. I, I can't, and that's all I've ever been able to do. Is kind of you know show them, show them how I relate to life. I mean, I get it. Don't you know? I'm uh, there's a massive uh, and say here in Thailand. I mean, there's, you know, you can say there's plenty there's plenty of rules and the way things are done that I wouldn't necessarily choose. And there's no end of indoctrination that I wouldn't choose. But I kind of also recognise that you kind of have to choose your battles as well. Yeah, my battle. And I, I have to work where I can be effective. My battle, and this is the way I see it, and I know I'm not alone. Yeah. I don't want sociopaths lying to me with false science in order to, you know, inject stuff into my child's body that will cause him harm. And, and you obviously have a very difficult kind of choice there because it's you know it's something that's very yeah, important. And now it's almost we're 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 increasingly moving towards where the scenario I've just said yeah. is going to become mandatory. You don't have a choice yeah. in it, right? Well, that's fine if it doesn't affect you, right? Yeah, it's not fine. It still means you're buying into a, you know a corporate mm. what is it technocratic agenda that that's that wants to can you know, enslave mankind. Yeah, you know, and as far as the virus goes, like at the moment, I would I would run and take it in a second if it would help. You know, I've been at the air job is there kind of rehab's been closed for the last uh, eight months. Mm. And if taking that job meant would open, yes, without without hesitation. Without hesitation. What no matter what, about, what, you know, what about though if two people that you loved Yeah, and I, and I know it's a difficult very, very situation much. for you. What 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 about if two people you love, one of which you love more than anything else in the world, had become seriously ill, Paul, because yeah. of having that jab? Would you still make them have another one? Well, that'd be different. Would I you mean, make them if have I, if I had one? that person experience? Well, the, well, this is this is why we need mm. to listen to all the voices instead of stifling the ones like myself who are yeah. speaking out about this, you know? Yeah. This and, I, and I'm not saying to, I'm, I'm not saying to, to, to stifle, like, you know, your voice at all. But, I, but, you know, we shouldn't be in a situation where people go, yeah, I'll do it if it makes it, I can travel again. That's, you know, that's not a moral, you know, we talk about being warriors now. Yeah. For me, that's the coward's way out. It's the same as people going, oh, when I'm in a such and such place, I just tell them I'm exact. I'm like, that's not helping. You're, yeah. you're supporting this system by doing that. What you need to do is turn around and say, sorry, you know, explain your, explain your reasoning and it's probably going to be different across the board, but so yeah. show me, show me the science, yeah. show me physically how somebody with an alkaline body can be a danger to society in, in the terms that you're saying, show me, the science that says that doing this act is going to protect me. Uh, you know, show me 
uh, the the evidence that backs up this transmission that you're trying to 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 control my whole life life upon. Um, show me whereabouts in human evolution did it become necessary? You know, yeah. When Stig was chasing down the tri 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 triceratops like did he wear his underpants on his face i'm i'm really gonna doubt it right i yeah. don't think it's the way we're supposed to evolve i i i personally think people get ill right people say oh there's no underlying condition yes if you eat western diet you have a massive underlying in that you are toxic from the start you might not be manifesting symptoms yet but your body is fundamentally uh, a re a, a blank canvas for illness right this it, it um oh the hospitals are overcrowded yes that's because we stripped the nhs rotten right we we've seen yeah. it happen for 20 years you know 30 middle managers and one person either either side we, we've witnessed uh it's winter more people get you know you, you know it it, it, mm. it we, Look, it, it's obvious you, you you feel very strongly about this. It's not this, Paul. Obviously, you've kind of researched this and you've looked into this, and and, and, it, and it's you know, and there's good reason for well, why I you think have. It's, it's not this, though, is it? It's the fact that when you've done your reading, you see where all this is going. To people who haven't read this book, probably think I'm the biggest tosser in the world, mate. And and you know, that's absolutely fine. To every every single person that read this they're like chris knows what he's talking about right okay i might have certain elements of it slightly skew poor uh, uh, but my interests are at heart right for the evidence and that's i mean and, and that's what's i mean it's obvious that you are you know you're concerned about your kids and and, and your parents well, I, and your I, I love all people you know? like i yeah. love all people mate i i i, I yeah. it, it, it's part of my spiritual nature that i've developed over, over over for the years um i feel for people you know yeah. when i walk down the street now and a young person comes the other way and then they jump into the hedge i think oh mate we've lied to you yeah. you know this is not how you behave you got your pants on your face does what 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 level of deludedness do you think that's going to achieve anything other than 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 demonstrate your 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 uh, willingness to be um com, you know to conform <laughs> to who to the people that br brought us the events in new york 20 years ago to people that genuinely want you to believe that that free men went went to another planet in a tin can right this is the level of delusion that we're operating under in society and I'm not saying I've got any answer for it, Paul. And I, and I don't either. I, 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 and, and that's the thing I'm saying is, I'm, count me in. I'm up for the fight. I don't mean physical. I, I'm up for yeah. doing what is right. Yeah. There's very few people like me left in the world. Mm -hmm. Most of them, either they're deluded because they get their info from mainstream media, or they're cowards because they know that's a crock of shit, but they're too yeah. scared to do anything about it. And that's understandable. We've been damaged our whole lives, you know? With this whole agenda, it's been to break us, to yeah. break our identity, to break us down, to, to, to fracture community, to put us in this home cocoon, to get us to change every aspect of, you know, people are now bigging themselves up because they work from home. You know, my partner works with some seriously damaged young people in despicable, the worst kind of depravity, some of the right yeah. our little boy's got to sit there right okay uh, you know but in these situations the child's got to sit on the couch self-learning on his tablet while his mother or father is discussing these very unpleasant you, you know not to mention the pressure that it puts people under that you're here doing your work and you've got to keep stopping because you're trying to homeschool your child or mm -hmm. And, and and it's and it is. I mean, this I mean, this has been, I and mean, a lot of the clients I deal with actually are are, are suffering from. It is, 
it's not alcoholic people or, or drug people a lot of the time now. I deal with people who are su suffering from anxiety and depression due to COVID, and absolutely, there's no denying that. I mean, it's incredible, and it, it, it's, you know, it's, who would have thought something like this would happen in our lifetime? And, and, and it seemed to almost come out of nowhere. And it has been, I think it'll be years Again, before we even appreciate how much of it, it's affected us. Again, I, I've got to keep saying this, folks. I'm talking to the friends at home now, Paul. You know, if you think this came out of nowhere, it's because you don't read. You, you don't study history, you know? Problem, reaction, solution. It's the oldest scam. The, the Nazis did it. You create the problem, you create the fear, that's the reaction. Then you come yeah. in with a solution, you know? Hey, do you know what? These you know what's they're gonna be free from the NHS. Do you actually believe that that it's gonna be free to you? What they're doing is they're gonna take 80 quid out of your taxpayers' money to pay to the corporate sociopaths, right? So you've already paid for this thing. Yeah. Then when you go to your GP surgery. You've got someone there who did five years in uni, right? Well, I've done six years in uni, okay? Or I think I did six years in higher education at, 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 at Lee, and, and I'm thick as freaking dog shit, right? I, it's not enough. I, I, I got kicked out of school at 15. I, I went back in, in, in my 20s. Actually, it was very, I was very lucky to be in England that I could actually do that, I did my A-levels and stuff. I did it all by correspondence. I kind of realized that I'm actually crap, I was crap at classrooms. <laughs> I I think part of having a, a an up and down young life is you sit in the classroom, you don't know why you're there, and it doesn't come easy to you like it does the oh. well balanced middle class kids, you know. Parents. And that's definitely true. Ed, ed, the way the education system is not for everybody. It, it, a lot of us that it's not that we're stupid. It's just that it's not our learning style. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can imagine there's a lot of people out there that they assume because of that that they were stupid. Yeah. Like, well, again, one of these lies, isn't it? You know, it, it, yeah, of course. that was the normal. When we were kids, you had the dunces cap. Yes. You know? They made you... And I, and I don't know about you, Chris. I, I remember my first day of school being so enthusiastic. I Looking forward to it. And what a shit show it was. I absolutely hated it. I spent a lot of time in school skipping off school. I hated it. Like, I just hated it. And I eventually got, got kicked out for stealing all the wine and, and, and a bit of vandalism. But it was just so, I just think of me, my first day, that, that enthusiasm. It's me, it's going to be, I'm going to learn about stuff. It's going to be so wonderful. <laughs> no. Yeah. But it's kind of worse now, isn't it? You know, you're going to learn about stuff that's going to allow you to spend the next 40 of your years of your life sat behind a computer screen or working in a call centre or, you know, and again, I mean, there's, there's people like you that's inspiring people to, to, well, to get out there. But I'm well aware, you know, for the amount, there must be some sort of algorithm or balance in life, isn't it? If I inspire 100 people maybe to do something a bit mental and, you know, get out and travel or whatever it is, that there's going to be the same proportion that are then condemned to being the ones that... <laughs> to but you can only do your bit, can't you? You can only have the little effect you can have yeah and it's obviously do have an effect yeah well this is the thing we we're going back about the veterans thing is it, it i don't really take I, i'm one of these people i can't take compliments paul it doesn't you know i just do yeah. what i do and and that's that's it I, very often i do rubbish stupid stuff that and it's not good right but but with respect to what we're talking about you know, I don't need compliments to do what I do. I just do it because it's the right way. It's the, it, yeah. I, I don't believe in law. I believe in universal law. You know, you've got to do what's right, not what you're told to do by the sociopaths, right? It's either right or, it, or, 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 or it's wrong. Um, so as such, I just do what I do. Like I say, I love, I've got a, compassion for people i think because yeah. i i understand what it's like to struggle and we all struggle you know we yes. all struggle um so it gets a bit weird when people write to you like oh my god off the back of the podcast so many people wrote to me 
that they didn't know what they would have done in their lockdown had it not been for the Bought the T-Shirt podcast, right? Fantastic. Job done as far as I'm concerned, you know. Yeah. I'll do the same for you, for anybody, whenever I, you know, my humble little contribution. You know, I just try to help people make sense of life, to understand what's, you know, to, 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 to the degree that I understand. But I also pe ask people to, you know, just consider it, it and i'm always saying this but i say it again you know i've lived worked and traveled in 87 countries across all seven continents i'm a pilot skydiver advanced scuba diver antarctic explorer polar diver i've written six books now i think i think i'm writing my 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 my, my, my seventh um i'm a graduate in the social sciences um studied social work at master's degree level I, i'm gonna say you should write a book but you've obviously you've written you've written three already i bought the t-shirt right <laughs> yeah you bought the t-shirt my point paul is not to big myself up because none of those things oh. mean anything to me other than great memories i i just did them because i wanted to i wanted to live this life right um but i've been to the extremes of mental health i've been absolutely mad Two. i've been absolutely mad told uh, my parents told I needed to be put in a, a mental institution probably when, when I was 25 Chris and I, I I was I ended up on the streets of London in homeless and in this very very you know horrible state I was so ill that I was you know I was buying those really strong ciders and you weren't doing anything and it's a horrible place to be is that I kind of knew there was help for me I knew I could have even called my dad in Ireland, but I couldn't do anything. I, and I remember I wanted someone to see me and, and I wanted to be sectioned. or so I wanted to be put on, on a psychiatric ward, but I couldn't do it myself. I just couldn't speak to anybody. It was just this incredible mental distress. It was, um, I've never had anything like it since, thankfully. It was just like complete horrendous alcohol induced mental distress. Mm. And it's like you're lost. It's like every everything's around you, but you're completely lost. And some people, I can imagine, how some people get stuck in that for years. And and, and you know, that's yeah. that's how I think about it. horrendous. Everything, everything I do is to just like maybe help trigger that one person to change a you know a, a, a paradigm. I mean, I I I got. I got the balance back in my life. I didn't go to a monastery. I didn't go to AA. The doctors, I, I, they couldn't deal with me because I would, yeah. I, I didn't feel that, I felt I knew better than them about myself, you know? Can, can I ask you a question, Chris? This, this is a question I, ask, I often ask myself. Yeah, can I just finish this? Point? Sorry. No, 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 no. All, all, all I'm trying to say is, is, you know, since those events in New York, right, mm. which I was like everyone else, I thought, oh, my God, well, we're all under attack, bloody heck. You spend 20 years, 30, is it 20 years now researching that? It's all out there, right? Unless you choose not to, all the architects of that event have all been exposed, you know, um, the people that put it together, why, who benefited, you know who were the puppets that were in you know and we all know you know we all name a few puppets right so i spent 20 years on a, almost like a mission mate to get to just work out what how was the world that i lived in up until i was 30 ish like not completely fabricated and false and not true so the last 20 years i've spent trying to work it out and so yeah, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, if I don't know what's going on, who, who the hell else is going to, right? Yes. I've had to do all this stuff to just kind of get like a grasp on it, right? So, see, so see, and, and maybe that's where we differ. I, I don't, I've given up trying to get a grasp on it. Mm. I don't believe for myself that it's possible. I, I believe, I, you know, it's just, 
the, the older I get, the less I recognize that I know. And see, one thing I realized a long time ago is I cannot trust my sense of certainty. That the fact that I'm certain something is correct or true doesn't mean that it's correct or true. And once you realize that, you know, it, it, it makes you very, very humble with your opinions because you kind of see, you know, God, like I've been deluded in the past. I've been so uh, deluded. I, now, now you're making me second guess myself because I completely agree. You know, yeah. I complete have my life gone a different way. You know, pro probably not. But just for the sake of example, after what happened in New York and Washington back then, I might have gone and joined the bloody US Navy SEALs. You know, yeah. had it not been for one university lecturer that said, Chris, have you uh, seen that video that's going around, you know? There's people saying that that incident, it, it, it couldn't have been possible, you know, this blah, blah, and then, and then of course, you know, you, you start going down that rabbit hole and your life changes. So, but I, I get you. Yeah. I, 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 last year, maybe two years ago, I met this guy and um, he, 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 he believed that Paul McCartney died in 1968. Yeah, that's a big theory. That's just a, another what I call obfuscation, you know. Like, yeah. but, but I listened to him and, you know, he, he had, you know, because before I would have just said you're fucking mad. But obviously I've grown up and I don't. But I listened to him and, and, and you know, he had a well-formed argument and he knew the material very, very, very well. But... I mean, I don't know, but it wasn't enough to convince me. And I kind of realized, see, I, I, and here's the thing as well, that, you know, I would be very scared if I ever reach a point where I believe I can be deluded. Hmm. I, I think that would mean I'm in deep trouble, that if I start believing my own bullshit, because I'm, I'm quite capable of believing in bullshit. It's the one thing, it's the one skill I always had. And so the only way I can kind of be safe is to not, and to not look for me, and I'm only talking about me, is I can't look for my answer in, in that kind of stuff. Yeah. For me, you know, not for that. Yeah, yeah but, but you know, you're you're my guest, Paul. You know, I wanted you on the show because you're you're a person I uh, you know got a lot of respect for, and um, at the very least, I like I know the kind of journey you've been on, been been on, yeah. right? You know. Yeah. I know what it takes to write a book, for example, you know, it's, it's no easy thing. I, I, I know what a, like a brave venture is settling in another country. Um, it's all good stuff. And I don't in any way, uh, you know, you're my guest, you're here to speak. It's, it's, it gets difficult because at least I can have this conversation with you. Yes. Sometimes when I'm talking to the military kind of people, and they start talking about good guys and bad guys. I'm just like, oh, yeah, fucking hell, mate. How old are you? You're you're my age, and you still think like the guys that you know with the beards who live in kept there. The bad. Uh, can you not see the bad guys? You know, how about the idiot with the fucking blonde Mohican that that he's in our parliament? Do, do, do you not um, do you not see how this works, right? I and I think, I mean, I think you're right. You know, I don't think telling people you're wrong, shut up is the answer. No, and it, and it gets cut. And, and when I have these chats with these kind of people, Paul, I, I, I know my audience is sat there going, they know what I'm thinking because they, they know me too well now, right? It's yeah. why they subscribe. What, to what, are you, what are you on? 120 shows, is it? How many shows? Yeah, we're up to about 100, coming up for 140 or about 130. Four, I think this will. Uh, yeah, they probably know you more than their significant other. Yeah. Bad luck, folks. Sorry, but they probably but, dream about you. But it gets a bit hard, and sometimes I just have to like chip something in just so people know. No, I'm not being a hypocrite. I'm not sat here just taking all this. It's it's. But this kind of conversation is beautiful because we can tease these things out, and yeah. I'm often saying, Paul, am I focusing in the wrong area? If instead of all this, you know, ranting and, and warrior talk shit, what if I went and sat in the back garden amongst the daisies 
and just, you know, yeah. let everything wash over me. And I get it. I get it that this, you know, it's called mindfulness. It's about letting all this stuff go. Like I completely get it. I get the, the, the kind of um, um, spiritual aspect or biblical or, or, or universal aspect where maybe our lives is a product of our thoughts. Mm. Like I, I'm, a, I'm aware of these things, but whether they are or not, I don't but think so. You're following your path, obviously. Uh, well, I think that there are... That's all many of us can do, isn't it? And yeah. I, I think that in life, human beings are generally quite good. You know, we all do stupid stuff, but generally, like, quite good. But I think certain people are not born like us. I think they're born with a sociopathic gene. And I'm not just talking about the corporate business owners who are just sociopathic by nature. Yeah. I mean, I think there are people that are, like through their dna have no empathy yeah. right and i think that and and the reason i say it is there's a wonderful book there it's called the babylonian woe and it talks about how the money system which goes back to ancient babylon it talks about how it was uh i'm gonna say resurrected it's the wrong word you know how it was put into how the whole of our society has been corrupted through this very one thing. It's the most powerful instrument in play in all of our lives. It's the money system. Off the back of it, all the, all the perversion, the corruption, you know, the ne nepotism, the, the this, the that. It's, it's an incredible, clever system. We just think money's money. I've got something in my pocket. I've got a credit card and I'll pay them all. You know, that's the limit of what my thinking would have been up until let's say a year ago right well actually longer because i've seen the the money masters videos on on you know i understand fractional reserve banking I understand how that's a massive con that the the elites use to keep us all in our place and you know they basically print the money and then charge us interest for for it right um so like you know what one thing that i i sometimes think about you know, at some stage, at some point in, in our history, some some human must have had the balls to say, this is my land. This is my land? Yeah. That they somehow said, like, they, they, and they managed to sell it to other people. That, See this? Oh, this yeah, 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 yeah. And it must have made that person had, must have had big balls. <laughs> well, it's no different now. They're trying to talk about selling water, aren't they? I don't mean water in bottles. I mean the water on the planet. There's people trying yes. to own it. This is what they're going to do. It, it's you know the whole system is perverted. It the, the the corruption is inherent in the financial system. It breeds corruption. That you know it, it it's everything that was ever good in life. Yes. But at one point, there's a king or a religious leader. Their job is to be good to their people, right? They're yes. representative. It's like democracy, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people, but I'm the spokesperson. So yeah. I'm not, I shouldn't have the power per se. I, we should be equal. I'm just the guy that's been elected to represent, you know, or, yeah. or maybe, you know, through birthright or, or not birthright's the wrong word, but through lineage, you know, I'm in this position, right? And it, it, and it was all gravy. And then these, these the, you know, this, the money system come along and they corrupted these people's thoughts. And it no longer become about how good you are for your people. It became about how much gold you've got in your vaults. Yeah. You know, how many horses and heads of cattle have you got? Oh, that is that what makes me good? Ah, oh, right. Oh, I thought it was looking after the people. Right. So you're telling me if I've got 100 head of oxen, like that makes me a bit of a dude. OK, brilliant. Yeah. What about some shiny trinkets? Oh, I've got a Rolex. I'm a really good person, right? This, this is, you know, this is kind of at its... But, but could it be that, you know, it was almost inevitable that something like this is going to happen? Because as human beings, we are all very fallible. We're not... Absolutely. Absolutely inevitable. When you've got this mindset that the... I call them the moneylenders. If I couldn't tell you, Paul, who they actually are. I'm, I'm not that clever a guy but i know it's mm -hmm. happening because i see it right 
when you talk about I've been wrong before, yeah, me, I completely get it, right? But what I go on now is I don't go on if I don't go on uh, physical, physical, the physical nature of stuff. Mm. I go on the scriptures, like the ancient law, yeah. right? So, for example, Lord Acton, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah, Tony Blair, you know, Tony Blair, this, this is it. Bush, you know, just absolute genocidal maniacs mm. because the, they, they didn't understand the power vested in them, right? And so now when I'm talking about like what's going on, I don't need somebody to tell me what I need to put into my body to be healthy. I look at my ancestral history and the evolution that got me to this point here. And I know that under nature, I'm a perfect being. The same as a bumblebee doesn't wake up in the morning and go, do you know what? I wonder what inoculations I need today. Or oh, I better do it for my kids as well, because you know, you know, it, it, I'm not saying that at different parts of human history, we didn't get ill from different things. We've lived in poverty, we've lived in squalor. We've been through periods in our life where we thought eating meat was like a really good, like you just eat meat, yeah, because that makes you like means you got a bit of money to throw around. Means you know, it's still like this in Asia, I know. In Thailand, why do the workers wear long sleeves in the fields and a big hat? It's because the browner you are, the darker you are, is symbolic of how impoverished you are, because the workers in the fields traditionally have a darker skin than the people that sit in the palace under an umbrella all day, right? This is, you know, I'm talking simplistically yes. here now, right? So, so to, to, my, to get my understanding, Paul, I don't go on like politics or arguing that, you know, buildings don't fall down or that. It's not about that. Mm. It's to understand, I think I understand human psychology. Yeah. I think, you know, I think I understand how easy we are to manipulate. And I understand that there's a, a faction in society or group that not only have the will to want to manipulate us through whatever, whether it's genetics or greed or just upbringing, it's not really important, but clearly it's done. That's why we've all got mortgages, right? You know, it's why our children are all studying now to go and work in call centers. Yeah. It's not really what I want, you know, I, I don't think this is done for our good. We're now all in the home cocoon. There will soon be a time where they'll probably bring a law. Sorry, cars are illegal now because you're going to infect someone if you drive somewhere. So you stay in your home cocoon. You work from home. Your drone is going to come from Amazon at midday. You know, book. you can change that booking if you want to two o'clock. You know, mm -hmm. it's going to bring you your, your supermarket drone or the shuttle you know, that works on electromagnet is going to zoom past from the supermarket at such and such and drop you. You, you know, th this is the way it's going, right? It is. Your, mm -hmm. your money's on a digital chip in your wrist. You've got your health passport here, or it's all on the same chip. You know, you're not allowed to even consider leaving your home cocoon unless you're all up to date, you know, with this. The information of which... Is controlled by the sociopaths is nothing to do with real science or medicine it's what they've decided to you know you, you got to understand friends listening you've been sold the biggest lie in your life it's called western diet right you're never going to hear a counselor professional well you 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 you're, you're hearing it more now because it's coming out of the you know the the, the health services and it's and there's very kind dedicated individuals that have educated themselves enough to know what cancer is now right thailand i know you have health centers there people can go to um if they develop tumors and they'll go there and they will detox them they'll introduce them to proper nutrition hydration you know this kind of stuff right here it's the biggest lie paul you know well in the world over this thing about the big bit of meat and the big bit of starch 
and the three peas on the plate or the little bit of spinach, you know, you mm. can't function on that. You'll get, your body will become so toxic that it will start to malfunction. And by malfunction, I mean tumors, right? Cancer. Still hardly anybody in society knows this, right? This is how powerful these maniacs are, that they're able to keep this basic knowledge. It's not rocket science, just eat what our, our ancestors would have ate when they're picking nuts, berries, shoots, roots, leaves, you know, occasionally maybe grabbing the odd injured rabbit. But you've got to remember, we didn't have technology for, for hundreds of thousands of years. It's very, very, very recent in our evolution that we had things like fire, and the ability to club down an animal, you know, th th this is, we, we, we developed as ga basically gatherers for them for, for so long, right? And even if I'm wrong, that's not even my point. My point is we don't, e we, we haven't even got the, the, the knowledge given to us to be able to have this conversation that we're having now, right? You well, I mean, I, I, I know, I mean, I absolutely agree that we have to, we don't have to, but in, in order to, to kind of achieve any say well-being, we need to see how easily we're delivered. That that's a, that that's a must. And, and, and to start to see that, yes, like, you know, that, that, that a lot of the stuff we believe is just because that's what we're told. It's not necessarily how things are at all. Mm. And I think, you know, seeing that, absolutely. And, and, and it's like, until we start to see that, we're, we're, we can kind of end up just being stuck or just moving from one delusion to another delusion. But to kind of understand how we're deceived and how easily we can be deceived, that's, yeah, absolutely. I, I, and because I don't know any other, I don't know any other path to well-being because it, so much, you're right, so much out there is about making us miserable. Yeah. Even though it sells itself as making us happy. And so being constantly, you know, so the, you know, the idea of a hedonic treadmill, that we're constantly being made to want things as if that was the answer. But it's just, you know, we, and we need to be able to see beyond that because that's never going to bring us to happiness. Never, ever. You're not going to, there's no new iPhone coming that's going to bring us to happiness. That we go, oh, I've made it to the last iPhone and now I'm happy. You know, that's never going to happen. And yeah, absolutely, we have to see that. And to not look for the solution in that. And to kind of see that we have a hell of a lot more power than we believe we do within ourselves. And, and if there is, I mean, if there is, and I don't know, I'm in the sense, I don't know about any of the kind of that stuff you're talking about, really. But if it's true, I mean, I, I think we'd have to at least be complicit in it. And it would have to be, we have to be being hooked somewhere. That, you know, that we have to, there has to be somebody that, yeah, if someone's selling the drugs, there has to be a part of us that's in the exchange. Yeah. And that's how people kind of cap capture us because, you know, and I think this is what I, I, I kind of say as well to people, you know, when we're, when we're looking for something, we're very, very vulnerable. And we're vulnerable to all kinds of things. We're, we're vulnerable to all the, the self-help stuff. We're, we're vulnerable to all of the, 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 the get rich quick scheme stuff. We're vulnerable to every charlatan. And some of them are very good. Some of them are actually trying to help us. But because when you want something, when you, you're hungry for something, you're in a, this very vulnerable situation. And for me, the, the, the goal is to get to stop being so vulnerable, to stop you know, to stop being so easily hooked, become less hookable. And if we can do that, and obviously the whole world isn't going to do that, but, I, I, you know, for me, some will. And maybe a sufficient a number of people do that. It can be helpful. Because I don't know any other way. I, I don't know. I don't know which barricade to join. <laughs> and I'm not that kind of... I, I sucked at that kind of thing. Paul, just one second. Yes. Yeah, Paul. So what I want to do now, let's just, <laughs> let's get away from the, the current situation. But you're you're very humble, mate. And I I um I take solace in that 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 uh, cut. If, if you'd have met me a few years ago, you would just would have said he's an asshole. 
<laughs> I'm trying to think back how long ago in my life I would have said that. I remember some... Uh, no, I was an asshole, Chris. You would have been right. <laughs> oh, okay. I remember when I got off my aircraft carrier in Germany once, right? We're all going on the, on the piss. And um, all down the dock in Germany were CND campaigners. Of course, we were a <clears throat> kind of shit. I'm not going to say the word because I don't want the MOD to, to be suing me for breaching the Official Secrets Act, but I think everyone knows what I'm on about. And I remember this CND campaigner came up and he handed me this leaflet. And let's be honest, whatever you think of this, that or the other, person just wants a better world for our children don't they you know and i was like yeah thanks mate <laughs> you know that's that's the person you can become isn't it if you're not if you don't have good guidance you know i remember once paul up in kent and i was with my best mate at the time and he's, he's called dan if you anyone who's read any of my mem memoirs and we joined the Marines together and we were walking down the street and there were two homeless boys on the side of the road. Right. And they were, weren't much older than boy, you know, teenagers or whatever. And um, when we got alongside them, Dan stopped, got his wallet out, pulled out, you know, 50, 60 quid, looked at these guys and went, yeah, still there. And walked, right and walked on i thought that was so funny mm. thought dan was a let weird in it how deluded we you know how, how far from the flock we can wander with and and and, and be completely sure in our mind that we're, we're the self-righteous ones so to that point, and that, that, that's what i was going to say to you before you know that just being cruel for no, like for no good, it was just like, uh, yeah, I'd be cruel to people, like sort of, met, like uh, verbally. And there was nothing in it for me. It wasn't like I was going to, there was no, I wasn't going to really benefit. It's just kind of hurting people just for the sake of it. And, it, it, you know, it's, yeah, absolutely. Then that was a kind of big part of my uh, thing. Paul, I'm just going to shut my office window because there's, yes. there's somebody hammering outside of it and I don't, don't want it to, come on the audio one second yes. coming back from behind the curtain the sound like this? say again how's the sound been oh very good mate excellent Are you sure oh brilliant yeah bet, better than we were before so i'm still recording um uh, Thai boxing, you've done a bit of that, Paul, haven't you? Yes, uh, yes, I, uh, I got into it when I was 40. Um, it was just something I needed to get out of my system. And what it was, I, I got into martial arts as a kid, and it was another thing I lost when I started drinking, and I always kept on trying to go back to it. So when I was 40, I said, you know what, I'm going to start doing Muay Thai. But I, 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 and I, I actually managed to train full time for a little bit. But the one thing I never got to actually fight. And this kind of goes back, and I had lots of excuses for why I didn't fight. But it goes back to this kind of timid thing that I kind of realized I loved martial arts training. But when it would come time for sparring, my heart would drop. And the, the people around me, they loved it. You know, you see, they loved it. They loved getting in there. And I just did not have that. Um, I think now I could do something about it. But back then I didn't. And I'd be kind of almost be, I would skulk at the back of the back of the gym. You know, that I didn't want to be, but you know, you, you kind of can only go so far with Muay Thai when you don't really want to fight. I mean, I did, I did, have, I did have one strange, I had about a three week period where I realized I didn't mind being hit. And that was incredible because I, you know, lived for years being terrified of being beaten. I mean, I'd be beaten up a few times, but I kind of, you know, I didn't like it. But then I had this strange thing happen to me that I was able, I realized I could take a punch. And I just went crazy for three years. I was kind of walking back home with a cup full of bruises and just, it was like kind of fight club. 
So it was kind of wonderful to see it, but I just, for some reason, I didn't have that, you know, this, and you can't mess around in Muay Thai, and it's so intense. It's, it's such a, you know, you can't go in there half-hearted. And I kind of realized I just wasn't, I, I, I really, I love the training. I like watching Muay Thai, but I just didn't love it to the same extent that a lot of people did. And a mistake, well, kind of a mistake I did. I actually signed a, a book deal to write a book about my experience. And I did it before I did it, before I kind of got to fight. And I kind of, I kind of in, a, in a way, I felt at the time really got in the way of the experience because it became more about writing that book. Is this the um, Farang's journey to become a Muay Thai fighter? Yeah, which he did, and I didn't choose that title. I, I, would, I would put a different title because I don't fight. Ah, uh, okay. I don't fight. No. I, just, I did the training. I, did, I went full time. You know, yeah, I did this. I I made a suggestion there to your publisher, which they have. I'm very specific in my writing. It, it's got yes. to right. Duplication is just such a massive no-no for me. And when they wrote that title, I said, no, it should be Muay Thai fighter, a Farang's journey to become a kickboxer, right? Mm. I.e. getting the duplication of Thai, you know, you, you don't have the same word in, in the tagline yeah. or, the, or the bootstrap, as they call it, as you yeah. have in the title. It's, yes. it's, yeah. this is no slant on you. It's just oh, but I would have changed it completely because uh, I didn't, it didn't end up being a kickboxer. <laughs> well, do you, do you have to fight to, well, it's a discipline in a way, isn't it? You know? Yeah, and I kind of love, see, and I, and I kind of, see, when I went into martial arts as a kid, I, I kind of, I, I actually love doing stuff like forms, like, you know, like kata and stuff like that. In the karate, they call it kata and forms. And for me, it was a kind of meditation. It was that that I loved, but it took me a long time to realize that. Mm. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really so glad I did it. And I'm really, you know, during when I was 40, during that time, it was probably the fittest I've been in my life because I did it, you know, for months, you know, really like training hardcore six hours a day. So you kind of, you know, you do your, you do your 10 hour, you do your 10 kilometer run, and then you go in and, and do the rounds, like two hours of really hard training. And then you come back in the afternoon and do it again, and this time you skip for an hour. And, and doing that, I mean, I reached this level of kind of fitness in my 40s that was, you know, much higher than my 20s. Mm. Were, you a I, were you a smoker when you were doing all your drinking? Yeah, I, I, I was always a very, um, I always felt uncomfortable with, with, with cigarettes for some reason. Because I got into training and stuff, so I only, I would kind of start and stop. I was never comfortable with it. Because I got into so much into martial arts and running as a kid, actually, as well. Mm. You know, I remember as a young kid, I thought all that was disgusting. And I was really disgusted with myself, you know, when I picked it up. I kind of didn't have the, I was never really comfortable with it. Yeah, got you. Oh, yeah. And it was never hard for me to kind of give that up. So I, I, I could quite happily be a, a raging alcoholic and, and that wouldn't bother me, not like cigarettes or anything. So going back to the fight thing, Paul, it, I find this fascinating because um, one of the questions I was going to ask you is, like, isn't it terrifying waiting to go in the ring knowing, you know, and, and you've almost answered that. Yeah. It's funny. Well, it's terrifying going into spa, you know. <laughs> that, that, that was... Yeah. A, yeah, I remember the first time it happened, and, and you know, I, I, to me it was unfortunate. My, my, my first sparring session was absolutely horrendous. And I don't know if it could be any, if it could have been better. But the guy I was up against was really he's this French guy who was a kind of heavyweight, and he was really, really good. And every move I make, he put me on my ass. I could, anything I did, he just. It was, you know, I, I end up being hurt. And I kind of realized there was no move I could make that didn't end up with him kind of quite severely hurting me. <laughs> and that was my kind of introduction to, to sparring. I'm just making a note here, mate. Sorry, I'm not being rude. That's okay. This is just great chat. Um, yeah, it's funny. Like, if I had to pick the two hardest men that I've ever met, mm -hmm. Um, one of them was guys in the Marines with, and he did karate as a kid, and he used to go to tournaments, and he used to do like full contact or whatever it's called. Yes. 
Oh, yeah, some of them did, yeah. And this guy was like, this guy's one of the leaders of the Manchester football, um, you know, football hooligan gangs. Um, and he said, Chris, when I was waiting to go into a bout, he said, I was just terrified. Just He said, I was terrified. He said, so when I got in there, I just went in guns blazing because I was so terrified. And I, wow. always, and I always used to win, right? Um, and then my other mate, Mal, who's an all-round sort of martial art, I think he's, he's got his own um, dojo. He just is a... He just is a hard man. He's yeah. like, I'm not scared of anyone, right? Yeah. Now, I'm not scared of anyone, but I am a bit scared of the beating that probably most people who know what they're doing would give me. <laughs> yes. Right. You know, you know, this is one thing I, I realised as a kid when I, when I really got into martial arts. I, I kind of realised there was people I knew who are nutcases. Like they were fighters and they were kind of, you know, and it didn't matter how much martial arts I did. I was never going to have a chance with them because th these are people who kill you hmm. and they wouldn't think twice about it. And I, I even kind of thought maybe fighting them would, 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 could even make the situation worse almost. That, you know, you, that there's certain things that you, you may not be able to train, especially that kind of mental stuff. Especially in terms of street stuff, not necessarily ring stuff. The ring stuff is kind of different. But, but that, you know, those kind of real people who are kind of damaged and they want to hurt people. Yeah, yeah. How do the Thai fighters manage to control their tempers? Oh, they're fantastic. Well, they have to because, so, you know, with a lot of the kids, a lot of them, you know, they're fighting every week. And if they get hurt, they can't make, they can't make a living. So they get really good. And it's not like they're going easy on each other, but they get, they're, they're just so skillful. They're just in, incredibly skillful at, at, you know, really laying in, into each other, but in such a way they can kind of do it again the next week. Oh, and it's, it's you know, the, and I really noticed this. I kept on having my ribs broke during, um, people would kind of do a knee in the ribs, but it never happened from a tight. It was always like a lot of the, so a lot of the Westerners are coming, they're like kind of bull in the, you know, you're sparring and they're like a bull in the China shop. And it's just whack, whack, whack. But that never happened with the toys. And the toys are incredibly skilled and you've got, they basically be using you like a doll, but not in a way that would lead you to any damage afterwards. So incredibly, you know, and I, they're just amazing. I know there was some, some Westerners, I think what, that Australian guy that was out a few, John Perry was or something like that. But there are a few Westerners that they really respect it. But they are, they are uh, fantastic at what they do. Well, um, when you see these bouts in, in the ring, like in Pat Pong, uh, uh, what yeah. are we saying? That these are more like expedition, ex exhibition fights. These, these guys do this every week. They're not going to like smash the hell out of each other. Well, I think they're even a different a different kettle of fish altogether. That kind of uh, in, in the bars thing. I think they might be even a kind of different league altogether. Okay. Maybe. And you got they have to, it's kind of different. It's, it's almost like different leagues, I suppose. Mm. But with the with the other guys are kind of going around to you know Muay Thai events, and they are laying it in. But it's just it's just it's much more. It's so skilled. I mean, with some of the, I mean, I think a lot, especially in the bars, you may not be seeing the best people. And what they would do sometimes, you know, there's a lot of Westerners who go to Thailand for the experience of fighting. And so, and you kind of hear about this, especially people my age, that, you know, you, you kind of go there, you train full time for a few months and, and it arrange a fight for you. Now, it, it might not be actually, if you're a 40 year old, who's a welterweight or something, which is my natural weight, it might not be that easy to kind of find someone. So what they'd often do, they'd, they'd, they'd get someone who was retired. We didn't do it anymore, but we say we give you some, we give we give you some money if you get in the ring with that idiot and let him just you know wear himself out for for for, for a few rounds. Uh, yes, it, oh, the whole thing fascinates me um, because Marines are that got that mentality that when they're you know on their on their R and R in Pat Pong, they'll get in the ring, you know. Oh and yes, they, yes. And I'm sure that a lot of them probably get the shit beaten out of them. Mm -hmm. I think maybe some of them have won, but 
um, these locals really know what they're doing, don't they? They've oh, that's the ones that are into Muay Thai, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and and they're dedicated to it. I mean, that it's a lifelong thing. Yeah, you, you kind of start when they're it's their life. Yeah, for a lot of them. Have and you seen? Uh, go on. I was going to say, have you seen the Tony Jaa films? On, I on, on back. Yes, I saw. I saw. I watched. I watched the first one. I don't know if I've seen the because there's a two, isn't there? But yeah, I definitely saw they, the they made at least two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. You, you know, one thing, but the dedication, and you know, with the the maintaining the weight. You, you, one, I remember one of the guys. Um, um, what was his name? Ken Sampinon, I think his name was. You know, some of the things they have to do. They run around, you know, in the middle of the the Thai sun, wearing these silver suits to bring their weight down, like a midday. Yeah. Oh, actually, they have they have this race that you must you must do, Chris. I think you might love it. You have a race in uh, in Bangkok. It's called Prapani Kumba. It means like the crazy piece, piece the crazy people's festival. And what it is it's a ten hour run on the track, yeah, but it's at the hottest time of the year, all the way through the day. So it's basically just against you know don't don't die of the heat and you kind of uh, you know many times you go right I think you have the minimum you can, if you do seventy kilometers you get a trophy but it's the, the thing is the heat seventy kilometers 50, 40 miles yeah so the big challenge is dealing with the heat it's the hottest time and it's really really humid but it's it's on a track so they've got loads of you know people trying water at you and stuff. Right. Well, I've got someone hammering outside my window, so uh, I think we better. Uh, I hate to use the word "end." It sounds so final, but end this here. But um, I've, I've loved talking. You're a, you're a fascinating guy, and I don't mean that. I know you don't like compliments, but you you you're a great interviewer. Wow! Well, so I'll be honest. The more I talk in a podcast, is usually a reflection of how fascinating my guest is because there's just so so much a that I want to talk to you about mm. and the thing about the podcast a lot of people don't don't get it. It, it like when I approach sort of people my age and above especially if they're sort of let's just say they used to be an upper middle class professionals or whatever they they really have a hard time understanding this isn't an interview I'm not interviewing I'm not the BBC I, I want to yes. chat to you I want to chat because I would never get to meet you if I didn't start my podcast, right? Um, and uh, let's just say it doesn't do you well on this channel if you write to me and say, "Chris, let your guest speak." It's this isn't this isn't the channel for you, right? No. It's not why I started the channel is to interview people. That's we've we've seen we've seen what all that mainstream media stuff does. I, I love the information exchange, Paul, you know? And, and really, I think it really, like this kind of, it puts people at ease. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's great. And I mean, don't get me wrong, there is a balance. Like, what, what I, what I hope people realise what I don't do is I don't interrupt my guests and then take them on a completely different tangent when they were trying to get to the end of an anecdote. Yeah. Whereas if you see people that are new to podcasting, they'll say, so Paul, you know, tell us what's it like for your first Muay Thai fight? And you'll go, well, you get in the ring and they go, ring? So Paul, tell us what, you know, what's the ring made out? And you're like, well, dude, dude, you, you just asked him one thing and he's trying to tell you. And then you yeah. just hit him with a double whammy burger and it's all gone to shit. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do a lot of these in the past with people. And, you know, the ones I found really difficult. There's some where you almost feel corralled. That, that basically, they're, they're kind of, the, 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 you're basically not allowed, the, it, the questions are put in such a way oh. that you're just being corralled and you're, you're saying, you're, you're basically saying they're scripts. You, yeah. you kind of, you're just going to leave and go, what the hell was that about? That I didn't really say anything. Yeah, I have but one guess on today. I had one guest once and obviously they'd been used to being like, you know, the center of other people's wrath when it came to interviews, because they were involved in some quite serious stuff. It was in the adventure world and, and uh, let's just say people had died. 
Mm. And there was there's always controversy around those events because suddenly everyone's an armchair bloody canoeist or an armchair swimmer or an armchair mountaineer or whatever, you know. Um, and the professionals sometimes are the worst for wanting to say how it is. So anyway, and I just asked a very simple question at the end of the podcast. I was it was just like I'd ask you now. It was a genuine, mm. you know. I said, "Did you want to talk?" A, and they were like, "What? You don't want to go?" And I'm like, "No, no. I'm 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 asking you. Did you want to talk about?" Yeah. Right, whoa, that's nasty of you. That was nat. And I'm like, no, you completely don't understand the environment you're in. This is a podcast. We don't have an agenda. We're not out to humiliate you. We don't want scandal. You know, if I, I, I must be the only person that's chatted with Alex Reed, who's a lovely guy, my parachute regiment brother. You know, he was the uh, tabloid celebrity for a number of years, right? Big Brother winner. Um, All right. I, I, I reckon I must be the only person that's chatted with him and not asked him about Katie Price, <laughs> right? I'm not. I think she came up a couple of times in the chat, but it's like I ain't got an agenda. I don't need to talk about. I. I, I don't. That. There's much more valuable stuff to be chatted about. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have chatted quite a lot in this, so folks, I, I will. I hope it hasn't been over the mark, Paul. Um, I, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed this experience. Good, good. Well, and actually, I, and I looked through. I, I looked through because uh, I looked through. You know your previous episodes, and like, they're obviously very, you know, interesting people. And I go, shit. I hope he. I hope I've got something interesting for him or for uh, your viewers. I say this. I've said this for the last couple of podcasts. I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in celebrity. I mean, if we get someone on who's been in the media, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But that's not why I'm, I'm you know, the, the chats I like are people that have a story to tell, mm -hmm. and that's all of us, really. Absolutely. Um, it's a little bit more why I'm probably always saying to young people, you know, think carefully before you condemn yourself to forty years in a call center right, playing Xbox and smoking a spliff in the evening, you know, it, it, that's fine, we've all done that for bits of our life, I certainly have, you know, and I've done, probably done it quite a lot more in my life than I would have wanted, but I guess picture the day one day, like, do you want to be invited on a podcast to tell people your story? And if all you've done is, you know, work in a job behind a desk and, and Unless you got really good at Xbox, <laughs> in which case, come on the podcast. It's you know you, you maybe might... that could be the new thing. You know, people talk about what, what would you say in your deathbed. Now we can start saying to people like everyone's going to have a podcast the day before they die, and what are you going to say in yours? <laughs> yeah, it's like the I've got friends that are gamers. They got gaming channels, and and they're ex Marines. You know, and they do very well. They do better than I do at this game, mm -hmm. right? And it's because there's far more people on both sides of the Atlantic that are interested in, you know, Call of Duty than they are listening to some old fart talking about. You oh, know, my son was showing me, you know, these people that do Minecraft, and they're multi, yeah. like some of them are multi-millionaires, and they're going around on tour buses like the Beatles, and it's it's incredible. Yeah. But the thing with these guys is they were Marines before they were gamers, right? Or they at least did both at the same time and so they've got something on which to base their channel right <laughs> um i think if you just i don't know worked in a call center for 40 years and played x but i don't know how what kind of podcast host you'd be put it that way but well, maybe, it's not really you like to have games of being in a in a, in a call center, the call yeah, center. I, simulation yeah, I've been approached to make games about my eating smoke story, you know. Yeah. That's my, my Hong Kong story. And it was, it's like a bit like, yeah, but it's just they want a cheap, you know, if it was your story, they'd be like, Paul, let's make dead drunk the arcade get, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the video game. So, you know, every time like you crash out on the beach, if a coconut falls on your head, you like you lose a life, right? But if you get up and running and you get in a time on a street and smash, smash, then you know you yes. 
you replenish your power, right? And it's like, yeah, but it's not. I can't see it working. Not now. really, but um, on a final note, how how was it writing your book? Yeah, it was in because it's really well I, written. Yeah, I am, um, and I haven't read it in years because it was ten years ago. Um, it, it actually it, it it happened really really quickly. Because originally it actually started as a blog on a, on a Thai v, on a Thai website here. So it used to have blogs on a on a website years ago. So that would have been about, about thirteen years ago, and then and it just came out. And see, for years and years, I'd wanted to be a writer, but I could never. I'd write stuff when I was drunk, but I'd wake up and read it in the morning. And go, oh, fucking, you know, what is this shit? And I'd been it. So, but as soon as I stopped drinking, it's like I kind of had this real urge to write about what happened to me. And so it, it came out kind of effortlessly. And I, I, you know, I just I kind of felt like I had to say it. I'm going to, sorry, pull my mic down because um, I'm trying to get rid of the banging that's coming. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, nice mic. The first time I've ever done a podcast with a microphone in, in it. So there you go. There's a, there's a first for you, mate. Yes, he blew, is it? Oh, yeah, yes, he blew, yeah. Yeah, I, we, we, I got one, we got one before, but it, I just can't get it to work properly. I yeah, this is, uh, this is the USB connection, so it goes straight into the computer, whereas you can get the, um, is it XLR connection, like the standard audio connection? Oh, um, yes, and did it take you long to write? Well, it was, see, there was different uh, versions of it, because I actually rewrote it again from Maverick House completely rewrote everything, but it was kind of based. So with the, with the original thing, I basically wrote a chapter a day and it was while my son was being born. It was, it was that week or that two week period. And it just kind of just, it was like, it was kind of, um, it'd been waiting. And initially like the, the spelling and grammar was appalling, but I kind of managed, I was kind of learning how to, I was learning how to do it as I went along. Same and I kind same. of, but, yeah same with me what you what you're saying now is you're almost like my story the only yes. the only bit of uh, one-upmanship i've got on you is that when i started writing mine i was still taking lots of amphetamines oh well and that probably made me write much better than, <laughs> much better than i could right not re well. not a recommendation folks um but you know, I'd read it back in the morning. Oh, fucking hell! I wish I could be like that sober. <laughs> yeah. So, did you, did you, how long did it take you to write to write that book? Um, very quickly. I was on and off the gear for many, 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 many years. As as a as a like, I got it. I went from every day to like once a once a fortnight to like once a month, which I managed to get to like once a two you know, like the urge would come over me then every two and I just couldn't. Re and they used to say, Chris, don't be hard on yourself. Just go and do it, but only spend a tenner, right? When it's gone, it's gone. You're not chasing it the next day. You know, just go to sleep, wake up, crack on with your life, right? And, <clears throat> and so bearing in mind, I could only write when I was a bit off my head. Um, that meant that my writing would be like once a fortnight, Oh, yeah. then it went to every month then it went to like once every three months and this went on for um did you have a book in mind when you started or like was it with the intention <clears throat> of writing a book yeah i i sat down one day and I, I i you know i was in that weird position where i've seen an awful lot of the world a lot a lot more than my contemporaries right been in warfare or been in combat been in the elite military force Da 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 da, and yet I can, I can, well, I could probably just about get a job in a factory, mm. but I'd soon be sat because I'm just square peg in a round hole, right? You, 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 you know. And so I don't know if you're like me. I I realised, you know, I'm only good at doing things I want to do. Yeah, and that doesn't tend to work in a work environment. No, no. <laughs> and so I sat down and I and. I say this a bit tongue in cheek, but I thought, right, you know, if I don't take some action, I will be the guy having to work in the, I mean, I worked in a mackerel factory once, 12 hour days, and we got a 20 minute lunch break, right? It's six hours is a long time to stand 
in a freezing cold, you know, warehouse with mackerel coming down the chute and you've got to take it, turn it the right way, put it through this machine. Oh, that's a horse mackerel that goes in the, you know, that's going for cat food or whatever. It, 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 I, I mean, I'm full of admiration. If you, if you want a definition of a hard man, someone that can do that for 12 hours a day, every day of their working life, you got my respect, I'll tell you. And thank you, because I love mackerel. But I, I could manage that sort of thing for like three months. I did salmon in Norway, which is quite much, much more fun, chopping salmon in Norway for, for did that nine months. Yeah. Um, but going back to the book, I basically had to reconcile myself with the fact I wasn't going to be the lead singer of Oasis, right? Couldn't play the guitar. Well, not very well anyway. It wasn't going to happen. So I thought, right, how can I get my five minutes of fame? Why don't I write a book, you know? What shall I write about? Well, what about that stuff that happened in Hong Kong, you know, all those years ago? Uh, yeah, do it, Chris, but make it good. So I literally sat down. I thought, right, how do you make the most sensational opening to, a, you know, what what first line? And I think because I've always read it anyway, Paul, it, I, I've got it in me, right? I think I've, you, I've got the neural pathways in my brain to be able to make it work. And I just tried to make it the, like the best book ever, you know, all of it. I edited it so many times. I tried to get the jokes funnier. It was really important that I, I, you know, your book's got humor in it. I didn't want my book. I didn't want people thinking I felt sorry for myself because I didn't. I was yeah. proud of my life. You know, I've made some stupid mistakes, but like, this is it. Look, what else? Would it be the same book today? Um, yeah, it would all be the same. The other thing as well, you've got to remember is when, when you bat battle mental health conditions, uh, in my case, addiction, and of course that's got the stigma of having the drugs attached to it, is, mm. is, even if you don't become a pariah in society, you feel that way, right? You know, you feel everyone wants to change you. No one will just let you be. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. I, I don't know. But, you know, you're made to feel like rather than as opposed to someone that's ill, you're made to feel like a second hand citizen. All right. And I wanted to come back from that and just just demonstrate for us now it's not all bad because i'm going to write a book and it will be a bestseller and yeah you know, it's probably a lot of ego talking you know ego we know we have to get over our egos don't we and i think well, it's there and it'll probably keep on selling you know well, well beyond you yeah yeah that's i thought very carefully about things in the book as i'm sure you did you know i, I never expected when i wrote a book about my was it 14 months in Hong Kong that was in 1995 and 96. I never expected now at 51 years old. So let's say 25 years later, I'm still in touch with all the characters from my book. Right. Yeah. One of them put his head in an oven and he's no longer with us. If you read my book, you'll know which person it is. Um, but uh, yeah, one of them, it you know yeah. surprised me, Chris. I don't know if this happened to you. I, I felt I was being incredibly fair to people in my book. Yeah. Actually, I was surprised how many people were offended. Oh. That they felt that I'd treated them, that I'd kind of, um, I was too harsh on them. And I actually, I, I felt I was doing the opposite. And I didn't, you know, because obviously people don't see things the same way we do at all no. and, and that's the one thing i learned from writing that and sorry for interrupting interrupting hey, it's, it, this is the chats that i love to have mate do you yeah. not think people are del generally deluded or of course some we all are and and and, and it goes both ways i mean because i had my take in it and it's like who's who's correct i mean because obviously i mean and this goes back to what we we're saying before i was very sensitive and so things that other people mightn't think were as big a deal really would, could hurt me. I remember seeing this uh, documentary years ago about mothers and daughters. 
And what it was, the mothers were, were saying about the, something they did and they felt really guilty about in regards to their daughter. You say, you know, uh, you know, I, I feel so bad I did this and, and I'd like to apologize to you. And the daughter would usually go, that was nothing. But you know, it really did hurt me. This thing. And the mother would say, I don't remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a very fascinating experiment. Um, you know, some bits of it have just been, well, most of it has just been a brilliant ride. Well, all of it's been a brilliant ride. I've got no complaints about any of the process, right? It's been interesting. For the most part, the books was received like 99.9% with, with gratitude from the readers, right? The people that haven't read it are the ones that are the most vocal about it, right? Which I'm sure is just part of modern life. Like I ha I've had people email me and say, um, sorry, Chris, who are you? Because like my mate, Dave, <laughs> he, he lived in Hong Kong from 1998 until 2001. And he doesn't know you. All right. right? Okay. I'll refrain from pointing out that Hong Kong has a population of like over a million, you know, I don't know how many million people. And I'm sorry, sorry, Dave, if you're out there, mate, that, you know, you know, even the expat community is hungry. Hey, it was Dave. Right. And, um, but it's just, to me, it's the audacity of writing to a complete stranger obviously with some sort of weirdly veiled aspersion that I'm probably like not the guy that I'm telling people I am. Like yeah. maybe I didn't live in Hong Kong. Uh, I've had other people write to me and say, why did you write? Why did you write a book about Hong Kong? You only lived there a year. And I'll say, well, that's, that's the year that I wrote about. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you know, um, had that sort sort of that just weird. You know, it's why I say human beings are a bit fickle, aren't they? they oh, are yeah. just, you know, well, they're all, they're eccentric. Let's let let's be different about call them. Human beings are eccentric. Yeah, but then I had the beautiful Anjali Rao. She's um um, uh, media host in Australia now. Very successful. She's met. I won't say the names because I'm not sure who I'm supposed to say, but she's met world leaders, you know, all this kind of stuff. She's got photos where she's interviewed then. And uh, in my book, it's quite interesting because when I wrote it, I called her Kerry because it's my, Kerry at the time, at least, was my favourite girl's name. You know, it's just, it's a, it was a beautiful name to me. So I gave the character in my book that I fancied the most, the name Kerry, right? And she was a stunner, stunner. And, you know, there's me writing a book about like, you know, is it appropriate to just jump on someone or is that going to get you arrested? <laughs> just, <laughs> just stupid shit, right? Right. Bit of military kind of humor. And um, like I talk about the time I went to her house. She lived on the peak in Hong Kong is the most expensive square bit of square land and, and, and on the island. Right. And uh she made some excuse to disappear. She came out with just like a negligee on, right? And I'm there, my eyes are like popping out of my head and I just don't know where to put my eyes and I'm off my head as it is. And it's all, I try and write the humor of this. It, like little did I know that 15 odd years later, she, you know, I get a Facebook message. Hiya. And, and, and Jarl. Kerry, and I'm like, yeah. he said, you popped it in my friend's Facebook feed and like, why am I not friends with you? And and of course she read the book and she was just oh, yeah. like, she was smitten with it. You know, she loved it. She laughed. She laughed at herself and my, you know. Um, it's, That's amazing. You know, it's incredible to have such a massive... One second, That's the one thing that happened to me, like people who had lost contact with did, did, did kind of contact me and I may not have kind of gotten got back in touch with them otherwise so it was great that way 
but I've had people write, you know, um, I, I don't like talking about the negative pool because overwhelmingly it's an awesome book, Eat and Smoke. Why? Because I wouldn't have written a shit one. Sorry. It's just the way it is. You know, it combines military experience with mental health, with crystal meth, the world's, you know, one of the world's most killer drugs with my brief experience. I'll highlight brief because it's not a book about Hong Kong trials, but I was a doorman for the, for a club run by the 14 K, right. Which was a, a fascinating side of life. It, it's a book about psychosis. I was in psychosis for the second third of this book, the last third of this book, right? It's, I'd never come across a book that's written from the perspective of someone who's living through madness, right? Yes. There's so many valuable lessons in there. Um, I'm using my, albeit limited knowledge of Cantonese, a lot of the books in Cantonese, obviously with English subtitles or English explanation, um, it, uh, talking about the, it, the British empire, Hong Kong, you know, before the handover, the ancient Chinese culture, the superstition, the amazing food, the Wan Chai gangland red light clubland district that that's open all night long. Right? It's a, it's a just such a good, a, a rich book is what I'm trying to say, and um, yeah. So overwhelmingly, the response has just been well. It's what I wanted, you know. Yeah. Um, still selling but it just does make me laugh mate when people you know they write you and they just say such a, obscure things and yeah. to you and I we know this is a reflection of where this person is in their life they're writing to you about the book that you wrote about your year in Hong Kong because they freaking wish they wrote one but they know that they you know, I, this, I don't know if this I'm sure this has happened to you um, because it happened to me a lot after the book. Well, actually, for now, it, it still happens very occasionally. But someone will write to me and say, I've got this really good idea for a book, but I'm not going to tell you in case you steal it. Oh, I've had, I've had that. And I go, no, no, the ideas are easy. It's the writing the book that's hard. <laughs> yeah, I had that. I had a guy that wanted me to give him writing advice, right? Yeah. Lo and behold, the first thing I got was a non-disclosure agreement that I had to sign. Wow. <laughs> then I tried to tell this guy, who's an old farmer type, that, that your story is, it's going to be great. But you, you, your, your word use is it needs a bit of working on, you know? Yes. You know, you don't say things like, you know, uh, uh, I went out the back door and sat outside the back door. It's, you don't write like that. You say, I went and sat outside the back door. It's just it's just the way it is. You can write it the other way, but it will be a bit of a messy read for the reader, right? You know? Yes. Um, oh, God, he, he didn't like that. Would, wouldn't be employing my service. You know, people just want to hear that, you. oh, your work's just bloody brilliant, you know? Yes. Um, funny, it's been interesting. But, yeah, I'm in touch with all the people. I took a very humble approach as in there was no malice in any of my writing. Mm -hmm. Even we're talking about tough, like gang leading triads is, you know, I understood where they're coming from. They, you know, I understand sociology and psychology and, um, but I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be unnecessary. I had no, I had no ax to bear after Hong Kong, mm. you know, the, the, it, I, to me, it was just an experience, not something that I had anything to feel bad about. So I think my writing reflected that, but when I caught up with um, old Ron, as he's called in my book, which I did, only did fairly recently in the last year and a half, um, it's fascinating, Paul, to hear his side of the story you know, didn't match mine. No. But I tell you now, that's because my memory is better. I'm not, yes. I'm not, I'm not bigging myself up. It, it, it just is. It's like, no, that didn't happen like that. I, I know that you think it did, mate. It didn't. It just did. It just didn't. And then there was the interpretation of my behavior. Yeah, you did this because of it. And I said, yeah, yeah, I did that. You got that bit right. You remembered that. I didn't do it because of the reasons you just said. It's yes. a completely different place, mate. I was mentally unwell. 
you know what i was experiencing wasn't your reality i was in a fake one so you know it, it's yeah it's been interesting interesting to write a book isn't it absolutely mm. absolutely Paul, I'm going to love you and, and just say a massive thank you. This has been one of my favourite um, chats in my life, and I'm 51, so that must mean it's a good chat. I, ho I hope we get to meet in real life one day, maybe on a run. I think it'd be fantastic. Yes, I'll come over there, mate. I've got um, got my friend Denny, former Royal Marine. He's got a he's got a, a boxing gym on uh, Gortau. Oh yes, um, oh, we can too. So, because I mean, I, I, I'll say this one last thing to you. What, one of the things I um, I always loved to hear about Thailand was the jungles. Yes. And I found kind of the great thing about running is you can go like the trail running in the jungles. It's oh, it's fantastic. Just have to be careful, don't you? You know, because yes. especially if you're going up volcano mountains and stuff, if you take the wrong trail. Not so difficult when you know the place, but as a as a tourist, yes. if you ever go in the jungle, think it through because so many backpackers take the wrong trail when they're coming back down, and it takes you in the opposite direction. And before long, you're disorientated and you're lost. You're in Lao. Say again, there. You're, you're in Lao. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're in Lao if you're lucky enough to get anywhere other than to go in circles and a lot of people yes. are doing that don't they of course yeah imagine yeah it. dangerous place it can be a very dangerous place on the other hand the jungle is just such a beautiful place to be yes. just amazing all right paul let's pick this up again shall we yes thanks thanks a million no really worries. Really i'm going to put the links for your books below the video so people will know Oh, thanks, mate. You know, and any social media links you've got. And maybe um, I don't know about the timing for you because I do a live show on Fridays at eight o'clock sometimes. But that will probably be, that'd be about two o'clock in the morning for you, wouldn't it? Yes, probably, yeah. Well, anyway, you're more than welcome is what I'm trying to say. Come on the live show at some point. We'll just take questions from our friends at home then. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And to our friends at home, massive yes. love to you all. I hope you've got yes. as much out of this as I have. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's been good. Please like and subscribe. Stay on the line, Paul. Oh.